Hi everyone, welcome to 5-Step Formula to Winning on the Web, presented by Alan Parkan, Parkan of Market Hardware, along with Doug Schatz, Matt Horn, and Lisa Benezra. My name is Lisa Wood, and before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, we encourage you to use the chat panel located in the bottom right-hand corner of the control panel on your screen. If you cannot find the control panel, you should see an orange arrow in the top right hand of your screen that will pop the control panel out for you. To ask a question, click on the chat box and type in your request. Then click the Send Privately box and direct your questions to Alan Perkan. He will answer your questions towards the end of the webinar. If we run out of time, we will follow up with you via email. All telephone lines are on mute for this call. This webinar is being recorded. If you are a member of the National Association of Landscape Professionals, you can access it online in the Member Center section starting next week. And now we're going to play a message from our sponsor, Dynascape. <laughs> continued support, and now I will turn the presentation over to Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you all for joining us. We've got an awesome couple hours of education ahead of us, and we're thrilled to be here. Um, so like Lisa said, we're, we're with Market Hardware. I've got a handful of folks that are going to be jumping on the presentation today. Um, we're going to spend the first hour talking about website best practices, sort of take it to the fundamentals and make sure that everybody's got the most important things accounted for on their website so that if we're able to drive more traffic to our website, if we're able to get our website out in front of more potential prospects, then we're going to feel pretty good about turning those folks into customers. Then in hour two and hour three, we're going to dig into some web marketing strategies. We're going to talk a little bit about SEO, some of the updates that Google gave us last year. We're going to talk about some traditional paid search ads. So if you love PPC, you love paid search, you want to figure out how to maybe cut your budget back a little bit. Lisa will give us some tips on how uh, folks can do that. And then we're going to talk about banner ad retargeting, which is a really popular tool. Uh, nowadays, it's it's basically what you know companies like Amazon do when you visit their website and you leave and you start to see those ads follow you around. So we'll tell you about some of that. So we've got a lot of stuff to get to. Um, the most important thing to keep in mind today is that we are here for all of you. Our goal is to educate as much as possible. That's why we're here doing this presentation. It's why we're able to speak at Landscapes each year. Um, we want to make sure that all this stuff helps the folks on the line because you're all hardworking NLP members, you're hardworking landscape professionals, and sometimes web marketing can be a challenge, but we don't want it to be as challenging as it can be. Um, we want to help you understand the ins and outs of it, get a better fundamental basic understanding of your website, how it works, who's coming up online and why. Um, so our goal here is to benefit you all. That's why, uh, like Lisa mentioned, send over your questions. We want to make sure that we're addressing things clearly. So if at any point today, one of the topics you kind of don't totally understand a piece of it, please chat those over. We're, we're here for you guys and we want to make sure uh, that we're doing a good job. So if there's a topic you want us to clarify, if you want us to go back and emphasize something, if you have comments that you feel like might add to the discussion, um, please chat those over on the right-hand side of your screen. One of the reasons why we have as many people on the call as we do is so that while Doug, Matt, and Lisa are talking, I can field those questions and then bring them up. Makes it more engaging, makes it for more of a two-way conversation, so we're, we're all for that. 
A um, couple other items, we are going to be sending out the presentation. I know NLP is recording it, um, but we'll send out a copy of the slides so you can save those. Don't feel like you have to scribble down notes of everything that's on there or take pictures. Um, we will break it out into the three topics. Um, we will be taking quick five-minute breaks between each topic, so um, in case anybody needs to get water, or coffee, use the restroom, whatever the case might be, we'll make sure to build in some of those breaks. Um, I do want to mention a couple other items before we start. Um, I definitely want to be sure to thank NALP. Without them, uh, Market Hardware wouldn't have these opportunities to get in front of uh, folks that are in the industry, and we do love educating folks. We know that web marketing can be challenging, but we also know that it can be really effective when it's done right. And without a platform like this, we wouldn't be able to educate as much as we'd like to. So of course, want to be sure to thank NALP and the fine folks there for everything that they do. Um, it's early, but I want to mention Landscapes. It's one of the best events of the year that we go to. Um, we've I've personally been there with Matt, I think four or five years in a row, and every year it gets better and better. So I know it's early, but definitely, definitely want to mention that. And then, of course, our fine sponsors at Dynascape want to thank them for their help and support for getting this event up off the ground um, without Joe and the fine folks at Dynascape. We had an opportunity to, to see their booth and see some of the stuff that they're working on last year at Landscapes. They're doing some great stuff. So um, definitely want to be sure to mention them and thank them for everything that they do to support the industry and for helping get this event going. So. Um, with all that said, I think we're about ready to jump into website best practices. So the reason why we want to start with website best practices is because your website really has to be the foundation of all of your online marketing. What we tell folks really often is you can drive all the traffic in the world to your website. You can have the best search optimization campaign. You can run all the ads in the world. But if your website isn't built to actually convert those people into customers, what's the point? So in order to get started with your website, we need to identify the purpose of your website. Like, why is the website so important? Why is this the central hub of so much stuff that's going on? Maybe you're the type of business where you just care about your website for generating qualified leads, for increasing sales. Maybe you just care about brand awareness. Like, you don't want to look like the the guy down the street that's operating out of the back of his truck overnight. You want to actually be a more credible, certified contractor. Maybe you want to build relationships with existing customers. Um, whatever the case might be, uh, one other example that we, we want to mention is if you're selling products or something, you're, the goal of your website might be totally different than somebody else. So in order to figure out how is our website performing, we have to really know the purpose of our website. Um, this might seem fundamental to some people on the line, but it's important to mention because this is a really important piece. You you can't actually, like, sometimes the question comes up at Landscapes where we're talking to folks and we say to them, you know, how do you feel about your website? How is it performing? How is it doing for you? And we're talking to somebody who's left scratching their heads and they're saying to themselves, well, I don't know. You tell me. You're the expert, right? I don't know how my website's doing. But if you're trying to evaluate your website, you have to first start by identifying the purpose of it. So if we feel pretty good about that, we know what our website is supposed to do. In most cases, it's probably generating more leads, um, being that 24-hour spokesperson for your business that tells potential customers what you do. Um, most of the time, your website is going to be your first impression when people look you up online. So when people look you up online, they're generally not going to go to your Facebook page first or your Twitter profile or your YouTube page. Chances are they're going to go to your website. And most folks say that the website, that's how they're basing their impression of a company's credibility. They want to look up your website and figure out, is this somebody that I can trust to come out to my home and do a good job? This is critical in the landscaping industry. So we have to take a look at our website and then put ourselves in a potential customer's shoes. If somebody were to visit your website, are they going to feel good enough to pick up the phone and call you? So here are the criteria that we come up with. But before that, I want to mention this 15-second test because this is essential to figuring out how our website is performing. We want to make sure that the folks that visit your website within 15 seconds are able to identify who you are, what you do, where you do it, and how to contact you. So here we have an example of a, a website that we really like. And you can tell right off the bat, you don't have to look very hard to figure out who they are. So you see 
safe and effective lawn care and pest control for Pensacola, Florida. Right off the bat, something like that says who they are, what they do, where they do it, and then you have a phone number in the top right that shows how to contact you. Again, some basic fundamental stuff, but it's amazing how many websites we take a look at. We probably look at hundreds of websites a year. At Landscapes alone, we probably look at 50. And it's astounding how many might miss little bits and pieces of this. You might think, just because I'm a landscape business, folks should know that we do lawn care and landscaping and pest control and tree care. Maybe those are extra services, but does your website say that you do those? So many businesses that we talk to, maybe you are experts in hardscaping and patios, or you do lawn maintenance agreements. Just because you fall under the category of a landscape contractor doesn't mean that somebody visiting your website knows that you do all of those different services that might fall under the umbrella or might even be a little bit outside the box, like I said, with tree care and pest control. So make sure that if somebody visits your website, all that information is available right off the bat because so many folks that visit your website, here's the world that we're living in nowadays, is they're impatient, they're distracted, they're on the go, they're waiting in line at Starbucks, whatever, and they don't have the time necessarily to dig through your website and figure out uh, who you are, what you do, where you do it, and how to reach you. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to do those things. All right, so I mentioned the criteria that we want to make sure every website is able to meet. And here's where we're going to bring Lisa on the line here soon and talk about some of these. But I want to mention some of them. So basically, these are the, the six criteria that we want every website to meet. I'm not going to spend very much time on credibility because we'll dig into that on the next slide. That's probably the most important one. So moving past that one, again, saving that one for the next slide, when we get to image, so many of the folks that visit you think to themselves, is this a company? Are these folks that I would want at my home? They're asking themselves that when they're looking at their website. Maybe not consciously asking themselves, but they're thinking to themselves, is this somebody that I would trust to come out and do a good job? The more that your website can convince them that, you would, that they would be safe hiring you and having you come out to their house, the better off you are. Brand. This is huge in the landscaping industry, especially like I said, with fly-by-night operators, folks operating out of the back of their truck, no insurance, no uh, accredit accreditation, credibility. Uh, you want to make sure that your brand stands out. Your website can do this for you. If you have things on your website that make sure that show you have a unique brand, a well-known brand, that's going to make you stand out from your competition. We're all dealing with how much competition is popping up in the landscaping industry. So your website is a great way to help you stand out, especially if you're struggling. I tell people this all the time. If you're struggling with contractors, operators that can charge bottom line pricing that you could never charge given your overhead, your website is going to be what helps account for that increase in price. All right, moving on to number four, relevance. Can you meet their needs? I sort of talked about this on the last slide, but just because you're a landscape contractor doesn't necessarily mean that somebody visiting your website knows exactly which services you offer. Every landscape business is different. You all know that, but your customers don't necessarily know that. They want to know if you can do patio reconstruction, if you can do hardscaping jobs, if you're uh, just a, a lawn mowing or lawn care company, or if you're a full-scale landscape maintenance contractor. Currency is also really important in the landscaping industry. You want to make sure that your website reflects the current season. So the pictures on your website should reflect what season it is. If you're somewhere like us in Washington, D.C., where we can have hot, hot summers and then cold winters, some of the images on your website should reflect that seasonality. Some of the text on there should also reflect that seasonality. Every once in a while, we'll take a look at a, a landscape contractor's website in the springtime, and it'll still say something about holiday lighting and snow removal. When a customer sees a website like that, they're thinking to themselves, well, geez, this doesn't look very up to date. Who knows when the last time they updated this was? Maybe it's been years. Maybe they're not in business anymore. And guess what? They're probably not going to pick up the phone and call and check. And then finally, personalization. I love this one. Photos and testimonials that actually represent your business. Again, if you're trying to stand out from the competition, having photos of your staff, your crew, your trucks, testimonials that back up the stuff that, that your website's saying, all this stuff is huge. You want to be real people online. 
People love to buy from people they like, and your website can help with that. All right, so I mentioned bringing Lisa on the line and talking about credibility. So, uh, Lisa, let's dig into that. Why is credibility one of the most important elements when evaluating a website? So I think the key here is that, you know, homeowners really have so many options now, and they're doing their research. So when we want to make sure that if they arrive on your website, it's very clear to them that you are not only an industry expert, but also a local expert. So we have an example here of a website that does this very well. It's about making those references and making those clear um, identification of your experience uh, in many different areas of the website. So, you know, showcase your accreditations, um, make sure you're leveraging uh, NALP here. That's great. And that's something that all homeowners are, are looking to see. So make sure that that is clear. Make sure it's clear the area that you service. Um, you know, maybe even kind of talking about how long you've served the area. People want to understand that you have the expertise in the industry and the local area. Okay, so then one of the other things that we talk about um, that's sort of like next level credibility and really solving for a lot of these criteria that we just mentioned um, is a tool that some folks are using really effectively. It's putting a blog onto your website. So the reason for this being that putting educational content on your website, this can serve many benefits. So it builds on that credibility that Lisa mentioned. It shows that you care about your audience, and I'll tell you about why. Uh, but it also builds relevance with a search engine. So in terms of showing that you care about your audience, we talk about educational content a lot, whether it's something like an email newsletter, whether it's social media content. Um, but here's what happens when businesses post things like maybe it's do-it-yourself, lawn care advice, how to get your grass look greener, right? The topics that your customers and potential customers are thinking to themselves really often. When you put that educational content on your website, it doesn't it, it, it doesn't only show that you're an expert and that you're credible, but it also starts to build trust with somebody that visits your website. If you're trying to convince them that they should hire you and work with you, having a blog on your website that gives that advice, that gives that education can go a long way to convincing them that you're the right company to hire. Because they're going to think to themselves, well, geez, this company cares about me so much that they're giving me advice and giving me education that in a way you know, it might mean that they don't necessarily hire you right then and there because they might try to solve that problem on their own. But we all know that they're not going to become landscape experts overnight, and they're inevitably going to end up having a problem where they need to hire you. This is what the top businesses are doing online, is they're putting that education out there for their customers and their potential customers, and they're building that trust with them so that when it comes time for that person to hire an expert, they don't even consider anybody else. They know Ah, well, these folks, they've done such a good job. They've given me this education. They've shown me some of these do-it-yourself tips. I've been able to benefit from the education that they've provided. And ultimately, they're going to end up hiring that business. Now, there's another really cool piece, which this is starting to get a little bit more advanced, right, Lisa? This is uh, not a, a super popular strategy, but we're seeing it more and more often, which is online video. So what are you telling your clients about that in terms of having – that kind of next level marketing on their website. So video really is a great way to kind of um, hit on quite a few of the criteria that we mentioned uh, earlier here. Uh, it's not the, the cheapest uh, if you want to create a really good looking professional video, but we found that the return really is there. It's worth investing in uh, a video like the one that we have shown here where you can showcase uh, who who really the company is. Uh, it helps with branding. It helps anybody that visits the website that is kind of in that decision-making phase that's trying to decide on the contractor that they want to invite to their home uh, to actually get to know your business and learn about your history or uh, really, really get to know the business itself, uh, it, it really does uh, a lot to boost trust. And, and another factor here is that people really do appreciate video content. Um, in 2019, it's, it's, a, it's a fact that people do stay engaged on a website 
on a landing page that they are able to watch video content. Um, and, and we see the metrics on our end when we're looking at these sorts of things. This can help visitors stay on the site longer, engage with the content, and um, actually convert into a, a new customer for you. And if anybody has any questions about uh, providers for getting a video done, let us know. We, we know of a couple. There's plenty of them out there. Um, we, we have a couple folks that we know have done some landscaping videos or videos for landscaping companies. So let us know if you need some recommendations on this. But I, I love this strategy. We're doing more of this on Market Hardware. Dynascape showed their awesome video that I'm a little bit jealous of. But if this is something that, again, you're interested in, let us know if you have questions about this. So we're going to dig into some new, uh, I guess we could put this under the category of updates from Google that really have kind of changed how your website needs to operate. Now, I mentioned Google, but really this applies to not just Google, but your customers, your potential customers, things they want to see. So we're going to talk about SSL certificates. We're going to bring Doug on the line and talk about that. Uh, we'll dig and do fast load speed. We'll have Lisa talk a little bit about that because she's kind of our expert here on website load speed and how to improve it. Um, and then we'll go back to Doug to talk a little bit about mobile-friendly design. I want to mention really quickly, we got a question from somebody specifically about a PPC budget. Um, so, Doug, I think that you might be able to see that question. If not, um, we're going to definitely address that in, once we get to the PPP, PPC portion of the presentation here in a little bit. It might be a little while, so I'll, I'll work with Doug, and, and we'll make sure that we get an answer there. But um, for now, Doug, let's bring you on the line, and let's stick to SSL certificates. What should we be talking about? What should everybody know when it comes to SSL certificates? Thanks, Alon. And one thing to just add to that last bit about video, um, I think a lot of people know this, but a lot may not. Google owns YouTube. Okay, so the bottom line is that if we're creating video content or your website or any of these things, it's important to keep in mind that there's two audiences for everything you do. Um, naturally, most of the folks we work with and, and most of the folks on this call think about how that affects their customer, but a lot of the practices we're talking about today really apply to how that is uh, something that Google may or may not be looking for. So video content is a big piece that they're saying, we want you to put more of it out there. We want you to upload it to YouTube. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to have 100 videos. I would choose quality over quantity in this regard, but good video content is something Google is now rewarding businesses for more when they do it the right way. Okay, so just shifting back to um, what Alon was saying about SSL certificate. So this is a pretty simple tactic, something that everybody should get knocked out. Um, essentially, uh, what's known as an SSL certificate was only really required on websites for the past uh, eight to 10 years where transactions were processed. So your Amazon, Home Depot.com, any online shopping. The, the purpose of this was to protect information, specifically credit card information that would be passed through a website so that um, hackers could not get into it. Now, as the web has become a less and less secure place and Google is looking for ways to differentiate one business from another, they've said, hey, we want you to have an SSL certificate on your website regardless of whether you're processing transactions. Just like you have your website hosted somewhere, maybe with a local provider, maybe with GoDaddy, maybe with Bluehost. Um, you simply need to pay your hosting provider anywhere from 100 bucks a year to maybe a one-time fee of $100 to get an SSL certificate installed. Um, it's not complicated. When you get off this call, everybody should literally just contact their provider and say, do I have this or not? If you're not sure whether you have it or not, please look at the... Um, image here in the bottom left corner of this slide where we show what a not secure uh, domain will look like in a browser and then what an SSL encrypted uh, domain looks like. It would say HTTPS instead of just HTTP. Um, you may notice that if you use Firefox or Chrome as your primary browsers, um, more and more times if you visit a website that does not have SSL, what will happen is you'll see the not secure notification or even worse, you may get to a website and it might say, this website is not secure. A big red notification that basically means anybody who gets to a website 
that sees that is not going to click through because they're going to be worried about what information they're clicking through too. So um, simple tactic, get it installed, folks. It shouldn't take more than a couple days. Um, you probably renew it annually. It's a negligible cost, but there's nothing worse than visiting a website and potentially seeing a notification that says this site may not be secure. You will not get a single person who's going to click through over to your site. Um, but it doesn't just apply to customers in that sense. Um, the other piece is really about how this is going to affect you with rankings. So just getting an SSL certificate installed doesn't mean you're going to skyrocket from page 10 in Google to page one, but browsers and so browsers themselves Firefox and Chrome and Google owns Chrome want you to have an SSL certificate and they've said over the past 12 to 18 months we're going to start um, putting up more and more notifications on websites that don't have this but it's also a simple tactic that will help you a little bit on the SEO the search engine optimization side something I know we'll talk a little bit more about here later um, but it's a easy way to give yourself a little bit of a leg up on your competition and make sure that you have what you need in place to be playing by Google's rules and also make sure that you're not missing out on potential customers who visit the site if they're going to get that this site may not be secure notification. So simple advice, contact your hosting provider, make sure this is installed um, and make sure it's something that you take care of in the next week or so because uh, you don't want any customers to miss out on the information they need from you. All right, so that's SSL certificates, and then we need to talk about page load speed. Here's a, a pretty interesting one, because if everybody, hopefully everybody on the line remembers the, the 1990s, the AOL days, and uh, we had a lot more patience with the Internet back then. You know, we were willing to wait to connect, and, you know, I'm sure people are playing the sounds back to, in their heads right now, the connection sounds on AOL and we had all this time in the world to connect for websites to load and now we're living in 2019 and if you've ever seen uh, pulled a website up on your phone and waited for it to load we don't have the same patience that we used to online we're living in a world now where we need the information that we want quickly we want it as fast as possible we want it right away and if a website takes too long to load, we're likely to just click out of that website and move on to the next one. So every second counts when you're trying to figure out how your website is performing nowadays. Users are expecting that fast load speed, especially on mobile. If your website takes too long to load, people are likely to hit the X button, to hit the back button, and then move on to the next one. So again, you might have a really, really great website, and trust me, we see this all the time when we're taking a look at websites. Yeah, a website might look awesome, might look great, professional photos, cool features, but if it takes too long to load, not a lot of people are going to see it. So we have a stat here that shows 53% of visits are abandoned if a mobile website takes longer than three seconds to load. This is happening every day on your website when folks try to visit it, and it's an important tool that we need to make sure that we're accounting for. So here are the do's and do nots of mobile website design. So here's what we want folks to do. Um, we want to make sure that there's text that's large enough to read. Simple. You shouldn't have to zoom in. I tell people this all the time. If you pull your website up on your phone and the first thing that you have to do is spread your thumbs apart in order to zoom in and be able to read the text, that's a huge problem. All right. Second, have large clickable buttons. It should be easy to click a button. It, you shouldn't ever experience trying to click a button and accidentally pressing the button next to it. Finally, you want to have your most important information front and center. I mentioned the 15-second test. I mentioned who you are, what you do, where you do it, and how to reach you. That information must be front and center. So that should be viewable as soon as somebody visits your mobile device or visits your website from a mobile device. They shouldn't have to zoom in and scroll around. You don't want to make it hard for somebody to find that information. And a lot of times what happens, if you take a website that maybe looked great five or six years ago and, and you show it on a mobile device, if it's not built properly, it's going to be hard to navigate. So that website that maybe looked great five years ago might not be passing that test nowadays. And we get it. It's frustrating trying to keep up with some of this technology, but it's important. This is what the top 
contractors in the industry are doing is they're staying up to date on the web trends. They're making sure that their websites reflect the current times. So even though a website may have looked great five years ago, maybe it's time to make some improvements to it to make sure that it still looks great nowadays. So the way to solve for that, Doug, maybe we have you come back on the line and talk a little bit about responsive websites because this, hopefully most folks have this accounted for nowadays, but um, what do you normally recommend when somebody asks, hey, how much do I really need a responsive website? Well, in 2019, it's not an option, frankly. Um, nowadays, it's not just about consumers. Again, it comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Everything needs to be about both Google and your your potential customers or your existing customers. But uh, if your website was built 10 years ago, odds are it's not responsive. Responsive design has really only been the standard since about 2015 or so. Um, and we tell our clients you should usually look at your website as a four or five at most six year investment. Websites like any kind of technology folks, over time they become dated and need to be adapted um, both to modern desktop screens as well as uh, modern mobile devices. But a responsive website is a must have for your business in 2019. Uh, if you're not sure if your site is responsive, you should uh, check with your current provider. There are tools out there that can also show you this. But um, more and more than half of all searches are done from smartphones now. That percentage is not going to go down at all. Um, so I think it's really important that everybody looks at this, just like the SSL certificate, just like the importance in, in getting some good video content out there. But I, if we're prioritizing what's most important, I think SSL um, and a responsive website are so critical because those are the foundation foundational pieces and the other stuff you can really focus on thereafter. Another good example is yes, blog content writing is important, but if you have a great blog and good content and it's not responsive, it's not mobile friendly, uh, it's not going to do a lot of good for you. Um, Google has recently implemented what is called mobile first indexing. What that means is that the content that's found on the mobile version of your site, and if your site is responsive, it's both mobile friendly and desktop friendly, is a bigger factor in how your website ranks for specific search phrases. And we keep circling back to ranking because at the end of the day, um, if you want more phone calls, you need to show up when people look for your services in local towns and cities. So um, some companies may have a separate mobile site that was built five or six years ago, or maybe even a couple more, um, where their website looks quite a bit different on a mobile device than it does on a desktop. Um, five or six years ago, that was okay. We even had done that for some of our clients at the time until responsive design came around. But a lot of times with those separate mobile sites, they don't have the same level of content. They don't have the same level of engagement as a responsive site does. So if you've got a 20 page website and your mobile site is um, three pages of information, um, Google is now indexing that mobile site as part of your rankings and not using your desktop. So you're actually looking like a company with two websites, which is something we never actually recommend these days. So um, responsive design is something that everybody should discuss either with their existing provider if you're happy or um, with whomever you feel comfortable with because it's, it's a must have. Um, these are the tips that in 2019 everybody needs to be thinking of because um, you don't want to wait until it's too late. Um, your rankings start to slip and then you're in a reactive position as opposed to a proactive position. Now's the time to have serious conversations about this. And look, we get it. Uh, it's February 22nd. And a lot of folks on this call are prepping for a busy season. Uh, and you're probably thinking, well, this is the last thing I need to be thinking about before I gear up for a really busy time. Um, we're just trying to give you the best advice we can and not to throw you a curveball, but only to say, you know, as, as members of the organization, we want you to make sure that you've got every tool you need um, to be successful because that's what NALP members do. That's why you're part of NALP. And we want to make sure that everybody understands the, this webinar, these member benefits are to make sure you have the tools to be successful, not just this spring, but into the fall, into the winter, times where you should be considering um, how you're going to continue to stay busy through 2020 and beyond. 
So the, we've we've got a couple of questions which I want to address, but we have one more really important slide to get to, which is about Google Analytics. So one of the things that you and I have conversations about really often is evaluating our tools and evaluating our metrics. And when it comes to a website, it's really the same thing. Your website is only as good as the data that supports how it's performing. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about this. We could probably do a whole presentation on Google Analytics with Lisa here with the amount of information that's available. But this is something that uh, would you say everybody needs installed? Everybody should have installed? What's your recommendation for using Google Analytics to get more out of the web? Well, the first and most important thing is it's free. So yes, uh, very directly, everybody should have Google Analytics installed on their website. There's lots of other tracking tools out there. Um, and if you've ever looked at the layout to Google Analytics, it can be a little overwhelming at first. Important to keep in mind that Google Analytics is a tool that's used by beginners. Um, as well as experts. And so the different layers of um, advanced metrics that you can get into can be uh, intimidating, frankly, for folks who just want to know how much traffic they're getting to their website. So um, we're not saying you need to turn into a, a Google Analytics expert, but um, smart businesses make decisions based on data. And data should drive not just how you operate your business, um, you know, the, the amount you charge for a job is based on the number of hours and the labor and the and the materials that go into it. Um, the dollars that you put into your online marketing should be based on the objectives and goals that you set for yourselves so that you can be as successful as possible um, driving new leads to the web. Now, from our standpoint, most important things you should have a sense of are how much traffic you're driving. And we don't always recommend looking at that as from a month to month basis. I mean, in a perfect world, you know what March 2018 looks like versus March 2019. Um, really comparing apples to apples in that regard so that you're showing the progress that you want to see for your business. Um, you can also see the amount of traffic that's coming to your site from desktop devices versus mobile and tablet. Uh, this is important because if you don't have a responsive website and you're driving a lot of traffic from mobile devices, odds are you're missing out on a lot of opportunities there. What we always tell folks is you can't quantify the number of missed opportunities you have by not having a better, more conversion-friendly website. But there are indicators within Google Analytics that can tell you a little bit more about um, how people are interacting with the site, where they're coming from, and how they're using your website. So <clears throat> we'll point out one specific example of a metric that um, I'm truly hoping that someday Google decides to rename, but it's called your bounce rate. Most folks we work with think about bounce rate when they see that and say, it's the percentage of people that are bouncing off my site. Well, it doesn't exactly work that way. Um, if you've ever looked at Google Analytics, uh, you've looked at this and, and that percentage might be 50%, uh, might be 60%, it might be higher. Bounce rate is the percentage of people who visit your website and leave without clicking into a second page. So if you think about that in practice, a lot of that might just be people who are looking for your phone number or looking to validate, <clears throat> excuse me, that you serve their area. So um, bounce rate is, is uh, often confused um, with a specific percentage of people who are just not good prospects. On average, a decent bounce rate will fall somewhere in like the 45 to 65 um, percent rate doesn't mean if you're at 70 things are falling apart, but that's pretty standard for what we see across most websites. Um, another question we get a lot is, um, are how long should people be spending on my website? Usually somewhere in the one to two minute range, 60 to 90 seconds is ideal. If you do a lot of landscape design and folks are more likely to click through a lot of your photos to see the quality of your work, it might be on the higher end of that. If people are spending three minutes on average on your site, that means one of two things. Most likely the site was not organized in a way that makes it um, very user friendly, or they're getting caught up by looking at too many things, getting distracted, et cetera. Look, your website is a tool. Um, you need to exercise that tool effectively. But uh, at the end of the day, we want them to pick up the phone and call you or submit a form. 
And if they're spending a ton of time trying to decide what to do with your website, whether they're going to pick up the phone and call you, um, a website has never necessarily sold anyone on your business. I'm sure no one on this call, maybe one or two, but very few people have ever gotten a call that said, I was so blown away by your website, I'm ready to hire you. Um, more often than not, folks are going to say, I saw pictures of a lot of the great work that you did. Um, really looks like you're capable of helping me out. Tell me a little bit more about your business. Tell me how you can help me and my home or my business um, achieve the goals that I really have. But uh, analytics is a great tool because it's free. Um, the good part is you can do a lot of stuff with analytics. The bad part is you can do a lot of stuff with analytics, meaning um, don't get wrapped up in trying to become an expert yourself. Focus on a cute few key metrics, set goals for yourself, make sure you understand what those metrics actually mean, and then measure that over time. Uh, for, for our clients, we really like to focus on a high percentage of organic traffic. So you can see the way that traffic comes into your website, whether it's from uh, organic sources or direct traffic, people who go straight to your site, as well as referral source, sources. Maybe somebody clicks on your Facebook page over to your website, your Yelp page, uh, a directory listing of some sort. Um, you want to make sure you have a healthy blend of those sources, but what we have seen historically is that if you have a pretty high percentage of organic traffic, organic leads tend to be the highest quality one because people who make buying decisions or are researching in the organic section tend to be the ones who are the savvier buyers, um, not looking for the lowest cost option. Folks who are willing to pay a premium to make sure they're getting the right level of service. So um, those are just a couple of important tips, and we recommend everybody uh, if you don't know if you have Google Analytics installed, check with your host provider or the marketing company you work with. Um, if you work with somebody and they have it installed, you should absolutely have access to those metrics because you need to know what's working for your business and what's not. Um, one of the things that I like to mention when we're talking about this, uh, specifically with NLP members, if you want to take a look at your website, at your analytics, and see how we think you're performing, um, we're happy to do that. You know, I sit across from Doug and I listen to him do consultations and do evaluations all day. Sometimes they're uh, very simple. Hey, your website looks really great. I'd recommend changing this or that. Sometimes they get pretty in-depth and we're looking at some nitty-gritty stuff. And in some cases, um, you might be spending a lot with a web marketing or website provider that is throwing a ton of data your way. And it's hard to figure out, bottom line, how is my website and web marketing doing? Um, Doug does these calls for NLP members pretty regularly throughout the year, and I'd recommend folks, if you're on the call today, to take advantage of that. So if you want us to take a look at your website, you want us to take a look at your analytics, you want to make sure that you're passing the 15-second test, you want to see your page load speed, there's tools available for all of this stuff. Um, so let us know if there's any of those things that we can help with if you want us to take a look at it. All right. So we're going to dig into some questions and answers here. We got a couple questions that I want to address. I want to remind everybody, if you had questions, please um, chat those through to us now, specifically on the websites. We're going to dig into SEO next. So there was one question about PPC. And, and Doug, I want you to address this, because I'm not sure we'll have you for the PPC section. Um, maybe this will give folks a little taste of what they can expect from that last section today. but. Um, Patrick asks, what is a good or decent PPC budget uh, per month for a mid-sized business under 500K? Um, we've tried it before with minimal results. So I hear you get these budget questions all the time, and I know that they're, they can be a little tough to answer, but what do you normally tell folks when they're trying to get a quick one-answer budget from you on PPC? So Patrick, if you're still on the call, um please go ahead and shoot a follow-up question to that that has a good idea of what the population in the area you serve is. Um, and I'm going to explain why that is. When it comes to paid search on Google, um, you shouldn't look at what your budget should be based on the amount of money that you make. Um, yes, that's a part of it, and obviously you can't spend an unlimited amount of money on what you do, but what you really want to make sure is that you're focused on right-sizing your budget to your industry and the population you serve. Um, the more people that are in the area you serve, the more searches that occur, the more cost that's associated with competing. So it's tricky to answer that, but I think what your question helps raise is something I tell everybody, which is don't go into Google Ads with the perspective 
perspective of I've got five hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month to spend. Let's see how many calls I can get from it. Um, what that's actually doing is backing into a budget rather than right sizing it to your market. And and look, paid search is like any other kind of advertising. It's not a faucet. Um, I do understand why people look at it as if I throw more money at this, I can get more out of it. But um, your keyword bids go into that. The ad copy is a big piece of that. The quality of your website affects what's known as your quality score, a metric that Google has that determines how often your ad will actually show up. So um, it's tough to answer that. I also would be curious to know if you do more uh, lawn and landscape services or if you're more landscape design oriented. Um, if you're doing hardscaping in somebody's backyard or you're doing uh, what sounds like we may have an answer to that question. Yes, yeah, so sorry to cut you off, Doug. So it sounds like we're looking at a population of half a million um, doing residential design and build average project about 10 to 15 K. I don't know if that gives you uh, the insight you need. All right, so I'm really getting put on the spot here. That's okay. That's my job. Um, this is a, a general estimate. So half a million people in, uh, and you're doing landscape design, you should probably be in the two to three thousand dollar a month range. Um, it's more expensive to compete in the landscape design space because the average cost of a job is a lot higher um, than you know general lawn care searches. Now those can be very successful, but the flip side is if you're in a seasonal market and you're just doing lawn care services, you really have to ramp up your spend because you've got a narrow time frame in which you're going to run that, so people are willing to spend more to compete. But Without having uh, the Google tool in front of me that I usually use, and there are tools out there on Google that can help you um, better assess this. I wouldn't trust a random third party. And, and if you're ever talking to somebody about um, a paid search campaign and they ask you how much you're willing to spend, that is a gigantic red flag. You should run in the other direction um, because that means that they're going to make their sales proposal to you based on your actual cost or your actual budget as opposed to right sizing it to your market and your industry um, because no matter what industry you're in doesn't matter if you're a pizza delivery place if you're a plumber and i will tell you plumbing and hvac are two of the most expensive industries to compete in on google even more so than your industry um, there's a sweet spot for where every budget should be a point at which you're not necessarily having to outspend your competition but a properly optimized campaign with good key keywords, good ad copy, um, and good restrictions around it will run optimally. The other side of that coin is you don't need, there's a point at which spending more money doesn't make sense because you're actually, you can't, um, you can't directly affect, nor can anyone else, the number of searches that actually occur in your area. So if you're doing really well, um, you're getting leads at an affordable cost per lead, and not every lead that comes through these types of campaigns are going to be um, great. Everybody should know you're not going to get a, a perfect lead on every call. Um, but there's a point at which spending more money doesn't make sense because you can't artificially inflate the cost, uh, or excuse me, the number of searches that occur. So um, sorry to give you kind of a vague answer there. I do think probably in the two to $3,000 a month range makes sense. Um, and if you have more questions about that, certainly we could follow up on a, on a separate call there. All right. And then the next question we got, we had another question about uh, YouTube settings. Um, so for the, the gentleman who asked about that, there are settings on YouTube specifically to what comes up after a video plays in terms of automatically playing the next video. Um, I don't remember exactly where the specific settings are on that, um, but I'm happy to dig into that if you want me to, to take a look at that with you afterwards. But I know that there are settings. We've run into this on our own about the stuff that pops up, the recommendations, auto-playing videos that come up next after a video plays. So um, we can help out with that. Now, Doug, we got another interesting question that I, I'd love for you to address, um, which was, let me go ahead and pull that up. Hang on. Um, okay, so website organizing a website for different customers. So if you want your website to solve for a couple of different goals, maybe it's advertising your business to homeowners, maybe it's to cities. Um, so basically the idea of like driving people down a path when they visit your website, um, how when you're trying to solve for a bunch of different purposes with your website, 
it can be hard. So my mind goes to figuring out what your priority is and maybe setting that whatever your most important priority is. Maybe you have to factor in what brings in the most revenue. Um, but I would boil it back down to whether what your main purposes are and which ones you want to prioritize because it's hard when a website tries to do too much um, it can be a little bit confusing because the last thing that you want to do is then have a homeowner visit your website and think well this looks like it's meant for cities or for you know other commercial businesses it seems like a b2b website rather than a website that's targeted for me um, and you don't want to turn those folks off, especially if they are your main source of revenue. So I don't know, Doug, if that if I that question, if I introduced that properly, but maybe you can harp on that for a minute. Yeah, I, I think um, certainly a, a valid and, and in some ways difficult question to answer. Most often when this comes up for us, clients are trying to figure out how to balance residential and commercial or perhaps municipal projects that they do as well. They may be 80% um, commercial and they're trying to grow the residential side of their business. Um, it's a balancing act, okay? So first and foremost, we talked earlier about the 15 second test, who you are, what you do, where you do it, how to contact you. Um, most importantly, don't try to fit all of those, you know, every city you serve within the first five seconds of somebody visiting your site. It's not gonna look um, professional or clean. Um, but let's say you do both residential and commercial. The majority of visitors to your website, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to be residential anyway. So you probably want that first uh, impact or the first emotional response to be um, something residentially oriented. This is probably a good place to have rotating banners on your website. We don't want a lot of those that can affect the load time and therefore the performance of the site. Um, but what you want to make sure you do is have happy family picture or your folks, your team in action, and then rotate over to a commercial job. Make sure that it's easy for people to get to whatever page best fits their needs within one click or two at most. If your website is not properly organized, they're going to be searching around. If they can't find what they need within 15 to 20 seconds, they're going to go somewhere else. So um, it's not necessarily that you have to have every city you serve or a page for every city you serve. Um, some of that stuff may be more about being found for searches in those cities, but more about balancing the services you provide. And like Alon said, prioritizing how you want to position yourself. A lot of folks come to us and say, I, I want to grow the residential side, but I don't want to miss out on the commercial opportunities I have. A skilled web development team will be able to do that for you. All right, so I think that that addresses everybody's questions. Um, I think what we're going to do now, unless anybody has any other questions, is we're going to take a quick five-minute break here, um, give everybody a chance to get some water, get some coffee, use the restroom, get uh, some breakfast maybe. Um, so we will be back on here uh, in a couple minutes. Um, I'll stick around in case anybody has any questions, but hopefully everybody enjoyed the website portion. Um, so again, uh, get what you need, get your fluids, uh, in you, whatever the case, and we will be back here in a few minutes. All right, thank you. Does that name sound familiar?
All right, folks, we are ready to jump back in to our next topic, which is going to be how to go from nowhere to page one of Google. Um, so in this section, it's going to be mostly Matt and Lisa. There are search marketing experts here um, overseeing all of our SEO campaigns, our paid search campaigns, our display retargeting campaigns. So between the two of them, um, I think it's safe to say not many people out there know as much about web marketing for landscape businesses as these two. So I'm I'm going to be in the background. I'll be taking questions in, and I might jump in with a couple of those, but it'll be mostly those folks talking. So just want to remind anybody that joined late, um, please do send over your questions. We got a, had a handful of them in the first topic today. Um, please do send those questions over. It makes for a more fun and engaging presentation, um, and it helps us know that we're staying on the right track. So definitely chat those over on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, want to be sure to thank the folks at NALP again. Want to be sure to thank the folks at Dynascape for sponsoring again. Um, we love doing events like these, but it's so much more fun when we can do it with uh, in collaboration with folks that we care about, like NALP and Dynascape, good partners of ours, great friends of ours. So um, want to be sure to thank them all. So. Um, with that said, I think that covers it. Uh, one last reminder, we're going to be sending out the presentations. I mentioned earlier, I want to remind people, um, definitely feel free to take notes, take screenshots, whatever the case might be, but um, just want to remind folks, we'll get the, the slide decks out this afternoon so you can save them and share them. Um, all right, so let's dig in. Matt, let's get these people to show up a little higher online. What do you think? All right, thanks, Alon, and hello to everybody here. Um, what we're going to talk about for the next hour is really a lot of search engine optimization. Uh, you probably get emails 10 to 15 times a day talking about SEO and your website not being optimized properly and everything there. So what we would like to do over the next hour is take you through how to properly optimize your website, give you some tips, talk a little bit about what it is that Google is looking for talk about mobile, talk about reviews, really making sure that everybody is on the same wavelength as far as what their strategy should be for getting their website to rank higher on Google. And we need to be on page one at the end of the day. That's where everybody is doing their searches. So this slide is always extremely important. I love this slide because it just is very short and simple. Google's goal is to provide users with the most relevant results and a great user experience. All of the changes that Google has done over the past couple years, and really when they do changes in general, it's for the user experience. Google wants everybody using Google. And if they can provide the most relevant results and make it easy for people to get the information that they're looking for, people will continue to come back time and time again to use Google. Uh, at the end of last year, the stat was around 88 to 90% of all searches on the search engines out there were done through Google. So they are the top dog and there's no question about it. And so all the changes that they make, whether it's mobile, whether it's speed, whether it's the way they read your website, is to try to put out a great user experience. All right, so what we wanna do here is talk really quick about the search result landscape. Now, this is an extremely important slide because we need to make sure that we understand the different sections of Google. So this is for a given search that is being done. And essentially, Google is split out into three separate categories or three separate sections. Each one of these requires its own strategy. So up at the very top are the ads. That's the paid search results pay-per-click, AdWords. You probably heard a few different variations of this over the years. This is where you set up a budget and you are bidding on certain keywords. If somebody clicks your ad, then your budget, that click gets deducted from your budget, the pay-per-click. If you don't set up an AdWords, if you don't set up a pay-per-click campaign, you're not going to show up here. So that's one thing. On the next hour, we're going to talk a little bit about paid search. Today, we're going to focus on B and C. In B, which is generally the middle here, this is the maps. This is the local results. This is where you set up your Google business page. You generate reviews to try to get you guys ranking better in that local map section. 
we're going to spend some time on this because as Google has made note, this is becoming more and more important, especially with people on their smartphones. The Maps is giving them a lot of the information that they need right there. So we are going to spend some time on reviews and talk a little bit more about that. And then as you go to the bottom where it's C, this is the organic results uh, or the natural results is a lot of times what it's referred to. And this really is what SEO, search engine optimization, is all about. It's making changes to the website. It's doing link building. It's doing different things offsite, which we're going to talk about, to help you show up higher in the organic section. This is where you're almost manipulating your website in a way to say to Google, hey, we're relevant for these search terms in these areas, and we're going to give you guys some tips on what you can do. And then the last one here with our three little, uh, or at the bottom here, the local service ads. We're going to talk about that in the next hour. This is a brand new section of Google. It hasn't been rolled out to everyone. It hasn't been rolled out to all areas, but we will talk about it. It's Google's guaranteed program. Um, okay, so we talk about the search result landscape. Now let's jump to the next slide. And before we dive into the specifics, it's important to kind of split out how much SEO should I be doing? There is not a one size fit all approach when it comes to SEO. And it's extremely important to know that because what one person might need to do is not gonna be the same as somebody else. A lot of it depends on where you're located and how much competition there is within your area. If you're in a small market with not a lot of competition around you, you can do the basic on-site optimization, work on your Google My Business page, and you guys may be set simply because there isn't enough competition around you to have to do some of the more in-depth SEO strategies. GMB, by the way, just so that everybody knows, is Google My Business. That's your Google Business page, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but that's where in Section B on the previous slide. So claim your GMB is Google My Business page. If you get into a more mid-sized market and you've got some competition around you, you might have to do some more work at the end of the day in order to achieve page one results when it comes down to your SEO program. So you're targeting your top search terms, you're doing your on-site optimization, now you're gonna get in some off-site optimization. And we're gonna explain what that means, but really what you're doing here is the work being done to your website, but now you're actually trying to get links pointing back to your website. So that's gonna be some of the off-site work that we do here. Then if you're in a really competitive market and you're going through and a lot of competition surrounding you, you're going to have to do your on-site, your off-site, we'll wrap in your social media management, maybe do some blog posting with trying to hit certain keywords and certain topics, review management. You really have to do everything. Because it's very hard to get on page one in Washington, D.C. for some of these search terms to go from there. So we just want to make sure that we hit this. Um, if anybody has any questions on anything we've talked about so far, please chat that in. We're more than happy to go through that. Um, Lisa, I want to bring you on the line here as we go to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about these targeted results and really what's going on with Google. So this is something that we've seen, you know, Matt and I have seen growing uh, is near me searches. So what does that mean? People are now expecting Google to know where they are and to sh serve them the results that are closest to them. So if you're on your phone and you're walking around, your location data um, is something that Google's actually factoring in when they deliver their search results. So, you know, when Matt and I are taking a look at the common searches, we've seen a, a noticeable shift in the past two years where people actually just are searching near me. And this is an important piece of um, why local search is so important. And I think we'll get, it, we'll get into that on the next slide here where we talk about local SEO. So that's really key um, because again, Google is taking into account your location. And we want to make sure that 
we're being as clear as possible about where you are, the areas you serve, and that you are a credible result in that specific area. So there's a few things that we have listed here, uh, including up-to-date um, NAP information, that's your name, uh, address, phone number, that's something that needs to be consistent across the web. So we want to make sure that on your website, on your Google My Business page, on any other online listings, um, that we use the same wording, the same way to um, indicate the, the spelling, everything about the, the name of the business, and then more importantly is the location. So if you have any old addresses out there, making sure that those are updated um, so that Google's really seeing consistency across all platforms um, throughout, throughout the web. Uh, Location-based site content, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later uh, in the presentation, but really, again, just making sure that it's clear the areas that you serve and then actually optimizing for those specific locations. Uh, and then a review management strategy uh, we'll also get into a little bit later, um, but that's really a crucial piece here. All right, so uh, it's a long again. I just want to jump in with a question. So I'm actually going to go back a slide to how much SEO optimization should I do? So Matt, I want to address this question your way. Um, let me scroll back up here. So the question was, when creating keywords, is more better or is it better to just focus on a certain set, like a targeted dozen? What do you normally say to folks that ask that question? Well, that's that's a great question, and we are we do have a slide in a little bit where we talk about the key phrases and the best approach. But to answer this question right now, it really does depend on you and the business itself. And what I mean by that is, let's say you are looking to push the landscaping side, but you also have the hardscapes, or you want to really try to hit on some of the outdoor living, outdoor kitchens, patios. Here, you're going to need to incorporate more keywords into the mix because you're trying to hit on different services. If you really just want to focus on one piece of the business to try to grow that, then you can really go all in on certain keywords, whether it's lawn care or lawn fertilization. When we have here target a few keywords in your hometown for small market and then large market target more keywords, generally the business is trying to compete in a large market, offer a variety of services that they're trying to get more exposure for. So to answer the question, we do say the more targeted you can be, most likely the better results you're going to have for that area. If you want to try to hit on 100 different keywords, then you may be spreading yourself too thin at the end of the day. But take a look at your business and what it is that you are trying to achieve. And if you say, well, Matt, I'm trying to achieve growth in everywhere because that's how our businesses should be run, then what we want to do is take a couple search terms, keywords, for each of the services that you do and really try to drill down on those. When we say target more keywords in hometown and more cities, in order to try to generate phone calls coming through in more competitive markets, you need to be out there in different areas. So I hope that does answer it. it, it it's a little vague once again because it's not the same answer for everybody on the call. But what we try to look for is pick out these services that you're really looking to grow and try to hit on those keywords as the most important ones out of the gate. And then if you are looking to try to uh, expand in all the different services, then we have to have more keywords. So is it better one way or the other? We really have to sit down and talk about the goals that you guys have in mind for the business. So I hope that does help. We do talk about identifying what your customers search for when we talk about the SEO basics in a couple slides from now, which Lisa will be talking about. So she'll explain a little bit about these search terms and what it is that we're doing and looking for. So she'll reiterate some of what I just talked about. But at the end of the day, the most important aspects of the business, those are the keywords that we have to be going after. So I hope that does help. Um, if we can jump a couple slides, and Lisa, if you can talk about Google My Business, this is the GMB here, talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to come back on and talk about reviews. Absolutely. So GMB, Google My Business, has been something that we've you know, focused on a little bit more this year and every year um, since it's been available. We've um, seen this platform for, for many years now, but 
every month it seems Google's rolling out new features. So it's really important that not only you claim the Google My Business page um, that's out there, and you actually uh, are able then to show up in the local map section, but that you take it a step further and you update the page regularly, you build on um, the, the content that's available and you keep it up to date. Uh, there's photos that you can add. There are uh, ways to highlight your product offerings, services, uh, and it's a really great way to when people are, are taking a look at a few different businesses, uh, and you'll typically see about three in that local map section, that you can stand out. So definitely make sure that you're utilizing these features and, and keeping up with it. So something that we've seen, um, there's now a question and answer section in, in here, which is which is really great. It's a, it's a way to showcase information. Uh, and you as a business owner can even go ahead and um, ask a question and then answer it. So you can, you know, play to common questions that you do typically receive and, and actually post that answer as the business owner. So this is something that's really great and definitely take advantage of it. Um, what what we do see as being one of the, the best features of the Google My Business page, um, depending on how you look at it, is going to be that review section. So um, I'll pass that back to Matt to talk a little bit about how, how to manage those reviews. Absolutely. So we'll dive into that. Um, before, though, we had another question come through that I do want to address, and it's good timing for this. So the question is essentially, we are located in a town, about 500 people or so, 20 minutes outside of our top market. So whether the top market is Washington, D.C., Des Moines, Iowa, we're 20 minutes outside. Is it possible to get good rankings in that area when we are 20 minutes away. So the, there's a two part here. I'm gonna start on the maps. In the maps, it is extremely difficult. If you do not have a physical address in that area, Google does pick people with physical addresses for the maps section. So for example, if you're 20 minutes away and your physical address is not Des Moines, Iowa, it's gonna be very hard to show up in the maps in Des Moines because Google wants people with Des Moines addresses showing up there. So this is where that section B on the screen. Google does pick first where people are physically located. And once again, it's because they want relevant results. So they wanna show the local ones with that address. But organic, if you are working on an SEO strategy for the organic section, there is a possibility that you can show up in Des Moines if you are working properly through the SEO channels. Just because your physical address isn't in Des Moines, in the organic section, if you're doing SEO the right way, there's definitely a chance that you can show up there. And we're gonna talk about some of the specifics of things that you can do to your website in order to try to achieve these goals. Now, at the end of the day, it is Google. So Google determines who shows up where, and there's really, there's nobody out there that can guarantee page one placement except in the paid search section. So organically, if somebody says, I guarantee that I can get you on page one in the organic section, well, we need to, to take that and tread lightly because nobody can guarantee it. But if you do SEO the right way, Google can see that you're relevant for that Des Moines area. So maps not likely, organic likely. I hope that that helps answer. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about reviews. And reviews, reviews have been out there forever. Um, but it has become a little bit more important today, last year, Google making changes within the local map section. Reviews has only gotten more important to your overall SEO strategy. When we're talking about reviews, we're going to focus on Google. Reason being, and I'll explain in the next slide, Google is still once again primary. And if you get a bunch of reviews on Facebook, does that help my Google ranking? No. If you get a bunch of reviews on Google, does that help my Google ranking? Yes. So we definitely are gonna be focused a little bit more on Google today, but people do turn to reviews. Whether you buy a product on Amazon, whether you're looking for somebody to come into your house to fix something, or whether you want somebody doing landscaping in their backyard, people do turn to reviews. 
and Google is very important when it comes down to it. So we're going to talk about review strategies. So as we jump to the next slide here, what I was just referring to, we need to make sure at the end of the day that we're showing up and getting reviews for the sites that influence rankings, sites that get the most traffic, and overall trusted websites. Google My Business, you can see the monthly traffic here. It's important. And also, this helps you with your Google rankings. Facebook, I don't want to turn you away from getting reviews on Facebook. Facebook is still extremely important. But a question that we get at least once a week is, if I get rankings or reviews on Facebook, does that help my Google rankings? Unfortunately not. But we do want to try with Facebook. Amazon, Yelp, TripAdvisor, there's a whole bunch here. You don't necessarily need TripAdvisor, Amazon within the industry. Yelp is a little bit different because of the filtering process. So we're not going to go through Yelp as much today, but Google My Business and Facebook should be one and two, with Google My Business definitely being one at the end of the day. So what we want to do is we want to talk about tips for managing your online reviews. So this is part one, figuring out which ones to get them on. Now as we jump to part two, in order to try to generate reviews to your Google business page, the person leaving you a review has to have a Google account. Okay? That, 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 that's a hurdle. It's a hurdle you got to get over. If somebody doesn't have a Google account, they're not creating another email address to simply leave you a review. They'll send you an email. They'll let you put it on the website. They maybe do it on Facebook. So we do have to pay attention and try to get people with Google accounts to leave reviews on Google. Make it a part of the everyday operation. Okay, focus on your employees. They should be responsible to try to get reviews. If they finish a great job and there's a satisfied customer, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, do you mind taking a second and leaving us a review? One of the tips that we have found is make it as easy as possible for the people that you're asking to leave a review for them to get to the place to post the review. So that was a little bit of a run on sentence there. If I send out an email to my customer saying, hey, can you please leave us a review on Google, put a link in that email where somebody can click and it takes them right to Google to leave a review. If I say to somebody, hey, go leave us a review on Google, but I don't give them any steps, then they're going to go on and try to figure out on their own. They might not be able to. They're going to click out and go on with their day. Always provide direct links where you can so that when you ask for a review, somebody clicks on the link and it takes them directly to Google where they can leave the review. Put it in your signature. Put it on an invoice. Put it on receipts. Make sure you have a link on your website. Make it as easy as possible for people to understand where they need to go in order to leave a review for you guys. We have seen that that really helps. If you guys have a list of your clients and you have a list of their email addresses, Put it in an Excel doc. Hit everybody that has at gmail.com. Send them an email with the link that says, hey, can you leave us a review on Google? We have seen that those results are extremely higher and much more likely for somebody to post a review when you guide them there. So any questions on this, definitely let us know. You know, one of the things that that is is if you're a business owner and you're trying to handle this all on your own, there are some challenges here. There's a couple different things. People may leave it on Yelp. People may leave it on Yellow Pages. People may leave it on random websites out there. You need to be able to track all of these. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to do that. So you can set up alerts, but if there's a lot of them, see if you got somebody in-house who can be able to manage this or talk to a company to see what they can do in order to try to help you guys. Market Hardware helps our clients with some of this as well because there is a lot going on. Now, when somebody leaves a review, we always want to respond as the owner. That's for a positive review, and that's also for a negative review. If somebody leaves a negative review and you don't catch wind of it until two months later and then you respond, it looks a little fishy. We want to be able to respond within a couple days and also responding to positive reviews. That's also a great idea as well. Responding to positive and negative reviews aren't necessarily meant for the people that left the review. It's meant for Brad next week, 
who's determining which company to go with, he looks at your Google reviews and he sees, oh, the owner has responded. They're on top of this. They know what's going on and they are understanding what's being said about their business. So make sure that we are responding. And if somebody leaves a negative review, especially if their side of the story is just complete BS, and you know that, we do not want to respond with emotion. We don't want to get in a back and forth with somebody. Once again, it isn't for the person who left the review. It's for Brad next week saying, reading your response as an owner, seeming level-headed, saying, hey, we apologize about X, Y, and Z. Please give us our office a call so that we can talk through this. They're saying, oh, okay, these guys are on top of it. Once again, they understand what's going on with their business out there on the web. So if this is something that you guys can't handle in-house, talk to somebody and say, hey, what can we do in order to manage our reviews online? This is a, a huge piece because, A, it's going to help with the rankings, but also, B, that local service ad that I mentioned earlier, which is the new section of Google, these reviews have a big hand in that. And we're going to talk about that in the next hour. So there's something to keep in mind here. Once again, any questions, please send them over. We're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to hit on some of the SEO basics. So, Lisa, I want to bring you back on here. Let's talk a little bit about keywords, key phrases. What the heck is a short-tailed key phrase? Well, that's a great question, Matt. Um, and before getting into really the specifics of the SEO strategy, I think it is really important that we take a step back and we identify what are your customers um, searching for, and you want to show up for that. So there, we want to have a combination of what we call short-tailed and longer-tailed key phrases. Um, essentially, we just want to cast the widest net possible and show up for as many searches uh, that your customers might be searching for as possible. So an example of some short-tailed key phrases and ones that we have seen um, be really the most commonly searched year over year. Um, you'll see that on the left hand side, um, lawn care, landscape design, these are going to have the most search volume. Um, they are also the most competitive um, search terms. So, you know, it, it's a little bit more difficult to get placement for those terms, um, but it's definitely ones that we want to make sure that we are focusing most of our efforts on. Um, but, you know, that only accounts for about 50% of the total um, search search phrases that we're looking at here. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're also incorporating some longer tailed key phrases into the mix. So, um, you know, people are actually typing into Google, um, you know, longer longer paragraphs sometimes of, of uh, content and maybe how to hire landscape service, um, licensed landscape company, things like that where, um, you know, that's an important piece of this as well. So we want to make sure that we're covering as much of this as possible um, and, you know, just trying to get in front of the largest audience we can. And so real quickly, so to jump in from the question earlier, once again, back to keywords, how many, how much should we be trying to hit on everything? This is a great example. If you guys are focused really on the design and installation part of your business, we want the short tailed key phrases matched with some of those longer tailed key phrases. And that's what's going to help you within that category of your business. So at the end of the day, we really want to focus on what's most important to our business and what we want to push for the upcoming year. But there's also a seasonal swing. So during the winter time, especially where you're located, a lot of people aren't necessarily doing landscape work or lawn mowing work because, A, the grass is dead and nothing is growing. That may be the time of year to focus maybe on more hardscape. And then when the spring hits, holy smokes, we've got to make sure that we're focused on the lawn care side of things, because that's when the phones are going to be ringing off the hook. So keeping that in mind is going to be huge as well as we're going through all of this. So I did want to jump back in just because the keyword question from earlier, we're trying to provide that good answer, but it really depends on where you're located and what parts of the business you're looking to push. Um, so Lisa, let's talk a little bit about once you gather these keywords, what do you do with them? Where do you go with them? What, what, what is next here? So what's next is actually implementing these 
key phrases onto the website. And the beauty with SEO is that we are able to kind of get in front of the upcoming season and we can, um, you know, change our our focus um, to, to make sure that once the the season hits, we are showing up in, in, the, in the search results for, for that particular service. So, you know, every time a, the cold weather comes around, you know, we've already started optimizing, um, you know, focusing a little bit more on the hardscaping side of things. Um, so that is kind of the beauty there. Uh, but as as for the actual implementation, there's a, a few key areas we want to focus on, um, and and you can see these here uh, in the screenshot we have the the URL. Um, so we want to make sure, and we'll get into some of the site structure uh, in in a few slides here. But we want to make sure that we're using the URL to our advantage. So this is a great example. Um, we have an area for services, and then the specific lawn care page um, is. Named Named accordingly we have a title tag here so you can see that if you ever um, have that top tab you can see in the corner that's that's what Google's looking at as um, kind of a title of that page so we want to make sure that all of the title tags throughout the site are unique and are also um, a good description of what that page is actually about uh, header tags as well a great way for not only search engines, but also users to take a look at the page and understand what it's about. Um, we also have alt image tags, uh, which are actually uh, descriptions on the back end of the site that will, will tell Google what that image is about. So when Google's taking a look at your website, they're not necessarily seeing that image. Uh, so what we will do, and I think an important piece of this is to make sure that we can incorporate some of these key phrases um, in, in those alt tags and in within the meta description as well, um, so that we really can explain to Google what services we provide um, and what the page is about and and um, that would that would be the basics all right and so these are the tips and this is if you're working through your website take a look at these check marks if something is completely missing or if you look at the title tag across your website and it's the exact same title tag that says Matt's lawn care on every single page of the website not really doing yourself any favors here with Google Google is reading your website from the back end, and they're really trying to figure out what you do, where you do it. So if you're not putting in landscaping, hardscapes, Bethesda, Potomac, Maryland, Google won't be able to understand that. And that's why it's very, very important to make sure as you're going through your website that you're hitting in some of these areas. The title tag at the bottom, Lawn Care, Destin, Pensacola, Florida, Mobile, Alabama, lawn fertilization. So right here, we've got many different variations of how people are going to be doing searches. Please don't go home and type in 75 zip codes to the title tag. It's going to be too long. It does have to find within character limitations here with Google. But these are some tips. This is what you want to look for. If you're working with an SEO company, feel free to ask them, hey, what are we doing about this? Hey, what are your thoughts on this? Get a little bit back and forth with them. These are the areas that we know for a fact Google is paying attention to. Um, Lisa, let's jump back in. So when we talk about content, what is Google looking for there? What, what are the best practices? What should we be doing? So, and best practices have changed uh, quite a bit in the last few years, and it's, it's really a testament to how fast Google is able to advance their, their technology. Um, but, you know, years back, it was really just about getting those key phrases into the website somewhere and and that was kind of it i mean that was the the quality content that you that you were looking for um, but in this sense google's actually set a higher bar for for quality content so just having the key phrases in in listed here as as we've uh, ex as we've uh, displayed landscape design, maintenance, installation experts in Rockville, Bethesda, and Potomac, Maryland. For one, that's not a, a readable title from a user perspective, and Google understands. So they want to be able to provide high-quality content. And at this point, 
keyword stuffed content, um, it just doesn't cut it anymore. Exactly. So we do have to make sure that it is written in a way that doesn't necessarily, that makes sense to the reader. So we just don't want to get in and dump in a list of keywords or make it the, hey, we're going to trick Google to understand this. Uh-uh. That the days have changed. Google's moved on a little bit. So we do not want to just dump in a list. We do have to have it make sense and have it readable if somebody else is reading it. If you read it and you think it looks funny, it probably is. So we just got to be a little bit smart about how we're going uh, to make these updates to the website. All right, so that was some good on-site optimization. Everything that we just talked about is physically being done to your website. So from our first slide earlier, when we talked about the lower uh, competition and kind of the smaller markets, it, what Lisa just mentioned here is all of the on-site optimization. But now if you're in a more competitive market or you're saying, look, I want to absolutely try to smash my competition any way possible, you're going to have to do what's called off-site optimization. When Google looks at your website, they are looking at many, 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 many different pieces. There's a lot of different uh, piece, uh, criteria that goes into what Google is looking at when they're looking at your website. Now, domain authority. You have a score at the end of the day with your website. It's on a scale out of 100, and the best place and the best thing to do to try to increase your domain authority is working on driving inbound links to your website. An inbound link, I have my site, mattsloncare.com. Lisa has her site, lisaslawncare.com. There is a link on my website that if a user clicks the link, it takes them to Lisa's website. Lisa is receiving an inbound link from a website out there that has relevant content. It's related to the industry. So Lisa is getting an inbound link. You can see in the little um, chart here, your website is the centerpiece. If you have a link from local chamber of commerce coming to your website, you're getting an inbound link. If you have partner websites that have a link coming to your website, inbound link. If you have an off-site blog post or you go and do a, a featured blog in, in your local um, online newspaper, linking back to your website, blog posts, inbound links to your site gives you a thumbs up to Google, and that's going to increase your domain authority. Your domain authority, once again, is a score that Google gives to your website based on many different factors, but one of the main factors is how many inbound links you have. Almost like a popularity contest. The more you have that are relevant, the better. Now, just like earlier on the last slide when we said don't go home and stuff in the 75 zip codes into one title tag, that's bad with Google and they don't like that. If somebody calls you tomorrow and says, hey, Brad, I can get you 500 links from some database in China, don't do it. They have to be relevant links coming back to your website. Quality over quantity here. Well, Matt, you've been saying more the better. Yes, but within limitations. We don't want a link for the sake of getting a link. If you have questions on this, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to take a look at the current links that you have pointing to your website and try to make some suggestions there. So we're going to jump into kind of the mobile world, but before we do that, we had a question that said, uh, where do I create title tags and header tags? It depends on the website that you have. So if you have a WordPress site, there's an area you can go. If you have a Squarespace site, there's an area you can go within the editor to be able to create specific title and meta tags. If you're working with a Squarespace or a WordPress and A, you have somebody at the company that you can contact, ask them, or if there's a tutorial that you can watch, please go ahead and do that. Every single website and platform is a little bit different in how you can do that, but contact your web provider and say, hey, I want to make some updates here. How do I go about doing that? And they should be able to walk you through it very easy. Um, Lisa, let's jump back in. Let's talk about mobile. What is, what is different now, and how, how do we know if we're delivering a good mobile experience? So we're, we're talking about mobile quite a bit today, and, and we talked about it in terms of 
what we want our websites to look like. And now, you know, specifically as it relates to what Google is asking for, um, really important to be delivering a good mobile experience. Again, Google's understanding that more and more people are doing searches on their mobile phones. At this point, it's about 55 to 60% of all searches are coming from mobile. So Google sees this happening and they want to make sure that, yeah, we're, we're, we're providing um, the most credible results to these mobile users. And that's going to be a mobile site, uh, that, a site that's optimized for mobile. Uh, so there's a few uh, key points here. Uh, a really important piece of this is going to be speed. Um, so I know we can kind of get into that a little bit. Um, also, we want to make sure that, you know, the actual functionality is there, um, visual and, and uh, everything is really, really optimized for mobile. So, Matt, you want to talk a little bit about this, the speed side of this? Absolutely. Once again, user experience. Have you ever tried to pull up a website on your phone and it takes a day and a half to load and you kind of say, all right, I'm on to the next? Well, that is a poor user experience. So Google had a speed update this past summer where they said, hey, now a part of the many different things that go into rankings, this is now a big piece. You are going to start having your speed dictate whether you rank high or not. If you've got a website that takes a long time to load, especially on the mobile phone, it's going to hurt you. If you have photos that are not optimized properly, it's going to hurt you. So we need to make sure that that website, especially on the mobile side, is as quick as possible because Google wants to deliver a positive user experience. There's nothing more frustrating than getting on your phone trying to pull up a website and watching it slowly load. And when I say a day and a half, in today's world, that's about five to seven seconds. So we have to make sure that it is crisp, clean, and that it loads extremely quick. One of the things at the bottom here, don't have too many images that rotate if your images aren't optimized properly and avoid auto playing videos. And what we mean by that are videos that start playing the second somebody hits your website. We love videos. We love YouTube videos. But make sure that when you click into a page, your video, your video doesn't automatically start playing. A, we don't like that because a lot of people may be looking at it from work, and if their speakers are on, this video starts playing, they're clicking out. But also, it takes a while to load that because Google has to load it a different way. So you're sitting here thinking, well, how do I know? All right, all this makes sense, but how do I know? Here's a tool. Alon mentioned before, he will be sending this out, so you guys will have this in front of you. But you can get a score based on what Google's looking at to your website. So you plug in your website URL, you're going to get a score for desktop and mobile. Take a look at it. Send it to your web guy. If it's poor, it's going to give you some examples of things you can do to help improve it. So we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we're in the green. We need that 90 to 100. We want to be ahead of our competition. We want to be the best in the business, and this is one way of doing that. So as we jump in mobile first, another update from Google this past summer. In many years prior, when Google determined what your website is about, they looked at your website from a desktop version. So they looked at it from what it looks like on a laptop, on a PC, on a Mac. They looked at it from that viewpoint first. Well, not anymore. Starting this past summer, Google now, when they first look at your website, they're looking at it from a mobile lens. All right, well, what's the difference there, Matt? Well, if you do not have a website that is mobile friendly, it's going to hurt you. All user experience. Google sees mobile searches skyrocketing over the past couple of years. So now they made it a priority that they are going to look at your website from a mobile first vision. So Lisa's going to talk about responsive websites and if it's a good user experience. But if you go to a website and it's hard to read the information there or you can't click to call somebody, that's not delivering a good mobile experience. So mobile first is huge. But Lisa, talk a little bit about what we mean when we say, is your website set up and optimized for a mobile phone? So yes, Google is now taking a look at the mobile version of the website first. 
So they want to see, you know, number one, that it provides a good user experience. So can you look at the content without zooming in? Uh, can you click to call on, on um, a click to call button? Uh, can you really clearly see the information? And all of this is really important because Google is able to see that people are going to leave your website if they can't click to call, if they, if they have to zoom in, and they take that into consideration. So that's really on the user side. Um, also, very, very important is the fact that the content is consistent across desktop and mobile. So in years past, you know, when we would, we would be working on, on websites on, on SEO, um, I think we really did pay more attention to the desktop version. Maybe we had a, a separate mobile site, and, and Doug uh, mentioned that earlier, that that was a, a solution at one point. But that's no longer the case, because Google's actually looking for, looking at your mobile site first, and if all of the content that you have built on the desktop isn't accessible, um, then then it's really not going to help you in, in the search results. So it's it's not just a, enough to have a kind of bare bones uh, mobile site that just has a, f a few words and a click to call phone number. Uh, we really, Google's now really looking for that consistency um, across mobile and desktop versions. So really about the, the experience and the visual, um, a key piece of this, and, and we'll get into what we believe is um, really the only solution at this point, is a responsive website um, where the content um, on, the, on the site actually adapts to uh, whatever screen it's being viewed on. Um, but at, at this point here, we want to make sure that the website um, is, again, optimized for the mobile experience and that t the content is delivered, uh, it's tailored to the, the user. So on your mobile phone, maybe you don't necessarily need to see all of the photos right away. Uh, you don't need to have all of the call out buttons. You really just want to drill down to what is important for that mobile view um, and make sure that you kind of tailor the content in that way. Awesome. All right, let's jump and we want to touch on this super quick. This is, once again, working with an SEO company, if somebody's doing some work for you guys, there are definitely a lot of tools out there that you can use to determine if things are set up properly through Google. Now there's a mobile usability report within Webmaster Tools, which is Google Search Console. I'm only just mentioning that just to mention it, where it'll uh, allow you if there are pages that are not mobile friendly, and then they'll give you tips on how to fix them. So what we need to do is if there are any errors, we gotta take care of those as soon as possible. Because Google, we just know they want no errors here, that user experience. So take a look at this. Any questions, let us know as we go through or talk to your web guy and see what we could do to make sure that there are no errors on the mobile usability side. So Lisa, let's jump back to you real quick and let's talk just a little bit about navigating through the website. So site structure is something that's really important. Um, again, and, and this is a theme that we, that we touch on uh, all day today, is on the user side and for the search engines. So from a user standpoint, we want to make sure that when somebody gets to the website, they're able to find what they're looking for. Um, page structure and site structure is really important in this way. Um, navigating, if, if your menu has tons of pages and they're not organized in, in an intuitive way, that's going to that's going to confuse the users and, and ultimately uh, prevent them from getting to where they want to go and most likely clicking off the site. So structuring the menus and the pages in a way that makes sense is really important from, from that side. And um, from the search engine perspective as well, uh, Google is essentially seeing the, the back end of your website and it's, 
it's kind of a, a roadmap for, for what your website is. And, and to be able to understand the way you've organized your site and organized the pages, um, it's something that we're actually seeing now show up in the search results. So if they're able to clearly see how, how you've structured the site and that can identify the, the pages that are kind of key pages for you, um, they're going to actually show that as site links in the search results. Um, and you can see this example here. We're taking up a ton of real estate on that search results page, which uh, is it's great to be on page one, and then it's really great to be all over page one. All right, so we've got about five minutes left, um, and we have two topics uh, that we're just going to run through um, pretty quickly. But the next one here is voice search. We have to talk about this because the way technology is advancing, we're seeing this increase as we move forward. Now, with voice search, really, it's speaking into your phone. So we know that there are services, Siri and others, where you can actually talk into your phone and you can go from there. Now, how is this important to us? Well, we need to make sure that we understand with our strategy and how we can optimize for voice searches because it is a little bit different than somebody going in and typing in landscaping Bethesda. So when you're talking into your mobile devices, voice search, and who is using it? What, what is really, what is kind of the demographic here? We pulled some stats that show really right now, the majority of people who are using voice search are within a certain age group here. So we're seeing kind of that 30, 35 to 40, 45 age group. And this is where simply on the phone, we're seeing a lot of voice texting now where you can talk into your phone, send an email, send a text, but also searches. And so what we want to do is try to incorporate our strategy into this piece of the puzzle that is a new section that we actually have to work on to get better exposure. It's not as simple as just putting in landscaping near me in your title tag because Google, that's not how they're looking at it with the voice search at the end of the day. So how is it going to affect my SEO strategy? Well, the same here is, well, we need to be on page one. At the end of the day, organic page one placement is, is critical to your business. If, if you're not on page one, especially in your area for top terms, we're missing out on such a large portion of people doing searches out there on the web. So what's the same? Okay, well, we got to be on page one. And we also, content is the same. So yes, there's going to be a little bit of a shift on the next slide that we're going to talk about with some of the content. But we still have to make sure our keywords are there. We still have to make sure that at the end of the day, if you're if somebody's going to say into their phone, hey, Google, what's the best time of year to start a hardscaping project? Maybe we have a blog on our side talking about that. That's what's going to help some of the content. That's what's going to help these voice searches crawl your website to get you guys popping up a little bit higher. The biggest thing here is the searches are going to be much longer. So when Lisa earlier talked about long-tailed key phrases, what we need to do now is blogs are certainly going to help with this. Having an on-site blog where you're writing on topics throughout the year can help with some of these long-tailed key phrases. But it's a lot easier to talk than it is to type. So somebody may go onto their phone and say, hey, Google, when should I start this project? Hey, Google, around my area, what's the best time of year to plant? And if we have something on the website that talks about this, Google's going to be able to find that, and you're going to have a relevant result at the end of the day. That's also why it's no longer okay to just list your services without any content surrounding it. This is going to be crucial moving forward to use as part of your SEO strategy. Now, location is going to be huge. So if you're 20 miles outside of a city you want to show up in and somebody does a voice search, it is going to be a little bit more difficult to show up there. But that's why it's as important as ever for those title tags to incorporate those cities that you want to go after. Now, how do you actually optimize for voice searches? I pretty much talked about it, but making sure that we're talking in the natural language. We've got our long-tailed key phrases. We're doing the question keywords. So even within the content, it doesn't have to be a blog. But let's say you have a hardscaping page. 
put in there maybe as the H1 tag, what is hardscaping and when should I start this project? That could be something, as long as you have a conversational piece within your website, that's what's gonna help you with some of these voice searches down the road. Optimize for near me searches. Matt, you just said you can't put near me in a title tag, correct. But you can still optimize it by having in the areas that you guys are trying to show up for. So if somebody's in Bethesda, Maryland, which is where we're located doing this broadcast, if you will, right now. If you are in Rockville, which is a town next door, but you got some great content talking about Bethesda, that's going to help your chances for the near me searches. So it's a lot of things that we preached in the past, but now it's critical because of these voice searches. And yes, the series and Alexa's and everything else out there. So we need to have our website content turn a little bit more to a conversational piece. And that's what's going to help you guys down the road. Right here, build out FAQ pages with some of the most common questions you receive. That's a great piece of advice here. Definitely something we want to make sure that we have on the website. That's going to help with some of these searches that are being done. All right, so wrapping everything up here, we hit on a lot. We hit on SEO. We hit on our off-site work. We talked about some social media. We briefly talked about pay-per-click. On the next presentation, pay-per-click and display are going to be huge. Email newsletter. If you guys can somehow incorporate, it does not have to be every single one of these. But you can see here, as you start to turn the wheel with some of these different strategies, the other ones will start to fall in place. If you're doing SEO, you're doing a little bit of social media on Facebook, you're doing some link building, you're sending out an email once a quarter to your client base with some updated information, and maybe you have a small display ad campaign running on the side, you just hit on pretty much everything minus the pay-per-click. If you're in a darn competitive market and you need some pay-per-click in order to make things work, you may have your hand in everything here. But they really all do go hand in hand, even though they require different strategies. Now, the last thing that we want to touch on, and I promise I'm done in two minutes, is just making sure at the end of the day that we're looking at good reporting. We're looking at good ways to measure performance metrics, okay? This is what's going to give us some insight as to if things are working or not. Are you holding your website person accountable or your SEO provider accountable? See if they can get some reports. Take a look at traffic. Take a look at where is your traffic coming from? Is it coming from organic? Is it coming from only paid search? Is it coming from direct? Take a look at that. This is what's going to help you for 2019 to measure if it's being successful or not. And then the last slide here is just call tracking. And we do want to throw this out there because as technology advances, so does tracking. If you have something like this, call tracking, you can see exactly where your phone calls are coming from. Organic, paid, direct, any of that. So I'm going to turn it over to Alon. We rolled through a lot during that hour. And I know we've got another one to go with some awesome information. But Alon, let me turn it over to you, um, kind of wrap things up from this particular presentation. Yeah, thanks. Um, we've, uh, we've got a couple minutes here. I think what we'll plan on doing is jumping back in at 11.05 for PBC and display. Um, but I want to mention a couple things. So we, we got a couple questions that we didn't have a chance to address out loud. So the first of which was about strategic blog posting. How important is it to use CMS tags and categories? So sometimes when you set up a blog, you can pick those categories. Um, generally, that's not going to have a big influence on SEO. It's more so just for organizing your blog on your end and making it easier to for visitors to navigate, go to different pages, go to different topics, et cetera. Um, but it's generally not going to get picked up on by search engines and, and have you come up for higher for those. Um, other question we got, is there value in adding consistent keywords to content that lives externally to our website? For example, tagging YouTube videos. Um, this is an interesting question and topic. We definitely recommend the titles of your YouTube videos to have some keywords in there. Um, you want to make sure that you are trying to get those to come up for searches online. So uh, maybe you want to put how to make your grass look greener. Maybe you want to put uh, steps to a hardscaping process. Um, if you're doing videos like that, you're going to want to make sure that you're getting some of those keywords into the titles because they'll come up every once in a while. Um, 
we've seen those come up online. We've seen success with those. So definitely want to be mindful of that. Um, I think that that should cover all the questions. Um, last one we got, let's see, does setting up a Google phone number help with call tracking? Um, I'm going to go back actually and touch on call tracking here because um, we're hearing this from folks. If you've got a lot of marketing campaigns going on and you're struggling to figure out um, where calls are coming from, um, call tracking is a, a, an excellent tool. Now. Setting up a Google phone number, I'm not sure if that would specifically help, but in general, call tracking is going to be a really useful way to make sure that you're figuring out how your marketing campaigns are performing. Um, the way that we typically do them, we, we partner up with CallRail on this. There's some other uh, providers that can help with this, um, but we try to figure out you know, what calls are coming from Google Ads, they're coming from SEO, just general website, any direct mail that you might be doing. Um, it's tough, especially with SEO, with organic search. It's hard to exactly match that up one-to-one. -one. Um, but there's ways to go about doing it. It's definitely a work in progress. It's not going to be a perfect science. Um, but we know that there's a need for this. So, yes, we want to make sure that, that we're building that into the plan because there there is a lot of use, especially if you're trying to um, get a better grasp on how your marketing strategies are performing. Um, all right, so I think that that sums up the questions. I got one more that I'll answer directly to the gentleman that chatted that in. Um, in the meantime, like I said, we'll be back at 11.05. So again, take a quick break, grab some water, grab some coffee, grab a bite to eat, and we will be back at 11.05 for paid search and banner retargeting.
All right. Hopefully everybody had a chance to catch their breath. I know that we've been rolling through a lot of content. Matt and Lisa did an awesome job on the last one, and we've still got some good stuff to get to, which is talking about traditional paid search ads. We want to talk about display ad retargeting, how that can be effective, and then we definitely want to make time for Google local service ads um, because that is such a huge game changer for folks specifically that lean more toward lawn care than landscaping. But we'll tell you exactly what you need to know about that. Um, we're going to save that. And that's kind of like our uh, grand finale because that might be a big game changer for folks this year. Um, so again, for anybody that may have joined late, just as a reminder for everybody, send over your questions. Want to thank NALP. Want to thank Dynascape. Without them, we wouldn't be here doing this education. Hopefully, you're getting a lot of value out of it. Um, if not, then uh, we'll have to try twice as hard on this last section, I guess. So this will be mostly Matt and I. We might be able to have Doug join us. We'll see. Um, but for starters, we want to take uh, another look, another revisit at the search result landscape. So again, Matt talked about this earlier on. Um, we talked about the paid search results at the top. We talked about the local map section in the middle and the organic results at the bottom. And when we're trying to figure out how to show up in section B here, you see uh, for the folks that aren't familiar, it says add. You know, this used to be, and I guess still is, where Google makes a ton of revenue off of businesses that show up here. So if you're trying to focus on this, it can be a really great strategy, but there's a lot of things that you might want to keep in mind if you're going to make this a focus of your business. So I want to remind folks, keep, keep an eye or keep this in the back of your mind, what this search page looks like, because when we start to look at Google, when it shows that local service ad section, we're going to see a couple changes. So in terms of that paid search results section, Matt, you still oversee quite a few of these campaigns. Let's start with square one. What is paid search advertising? All right. So paid search, pay per click, AdWords, uh, different variations of it. But this is where you are spending your money to show up for people who are doing searches and then clicking onto your ad. So this is the only way that you can guarantee page one placement at the end of the day. Now, the thing with pay-per-click, as Alon mentioned, yes, it has gotten a little bit more expensive over the years, and that's because of a bunch of changes that Google has made. One of them is they took out a lot of this actual section a few years ago. If you guys can remember five, six years ago, the ads also showed up on the right-hand side. Well, they no longer do. So there's less real estate at the end of the day. Plus, depending on who your competitors are, but if you're in a certain market that has some of the national franchises or some of the major, major companies or the bigger ones, they may have thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month to spend on pay-per-click advertising. And they'll end up outbidding everybody. And that's called vanity bidding, where they basically say, I don't care what anybody spends. We want to outbid them. So when you set up your budget, you set up your budget, you have your list of keywords, and then you are bidding on certain keywords in order to show up there. The way that the software works is you're not going to show up all day, every day, because if you did, then your budget may run out within a day or two. It's based on when search volume is, when people are clicking, when people are calling, when you have a list of keyword and it matches what somebody is doing a search for, your ad is going to show up at the very top or at the bottom in the paid ad section. Once again, it won't be all the time because then your budget's going to run through extremely fast and that's going to be a little bit of a waste. So if you're in a major market, you may have to spend three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month on paid search in order to even compete with some of the other people in the area. It is still extremely effective. It's just unfortunately a little bit more expensive than it has been. So your money or the budget, every time somebody clicks on your ad, whatever you just bid for that certain keyword gets deducted from your overall budget. Now, the one thing about this is it is a little bit more of an on and off switch than SEO, for example. So we spent the last presentation talking about SEO. 
you really have to work at that and you can't take breaks or else the work gets undone. If you want to run paid search for your busy season, maybe March through June, that's perfectly acceptable to try to get as many of the clicks that are going on out there. So this is still an, an effective section or way to advertise. Um, any specific questions, definitely let us know. But what are some of the benefits of this? So reporting is going to be huge. So you're going to be able to set up your budget based on tools that say this area gets X amount of searches and the population here. A lot of paid searches set up surrounding radius. So if you've got a 20-mile radius around your business, you're going to try to encompass people within those areas who are doing searches for the search terms that you guys are bidding on. So just like on SEO, you're going after your top keywords, but here you can actually filter out the ones that you don't want. Those are called negative keywords. So if you don't want anything to do with lawn mowing, you can actually have that as a negative keyword, so you will never spend money on that specific search term. So it does have more control at the end of the day of what you want to go after. So setting up your budget, determining your keywords, and then depending on your provider, you may be able to track and listen to all of your phone calls. Generally, the best practice is have a tracking number on your ads and if you're able to listen to them, you can have somebody maybe in the office or if you're working with somebody, they can listen to the calls that came through on your cycle and they can say, hey, we got 55 phone calls, 38 of them turned into jobs. Out of the 38 jobs, this is how much we made. We spent X and we got Y in return. You can really boil down and closely monitor the ROI from this specific campaign. The tracking capabilities with paid search is extremely measurable at the end of the day. The only way they were able to call you from this tracking number is if they clicked an ad. That number isn't anywhere else out there on the web. So a lot of companies still run this. Google still makes billions with a B of dollars a year on ad revenue. So people are clicking. It is effective. It's just gotten a little bit more expensive because there isn't as much room. And also some of the bigger companies are just sitting at the top and outbidding everybody. So if you have any questions on this, please let us know. But Alon, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about something a little bit newer. What are these display ads? Yeah, this is an awesome strategy for winning on the web, right? Which is the reason everybody's here today. We want the formula for winning on the web and display ad retargeting, we feel like can be a big part of that success. So I mentioned at the very beginning of the call today, that this is a strategy that Amazon uses really frequently, that a handful of other big uh, conglomerates out there use. So if you've ever visited a website and then noticed an ad has followed you around on the internet, that's display ad retargeting. The reason it is so effective and so successful nowadays is because like Matt and I have said a handful of times, there's so many consumers now that are on the go, they're looking to get information really quickly, they're looking up websites on their phone, Maybe they're looking up three, four, five different websites while they're walking to the metro, they're waiting in line at the grocery store, they're at work. Um, but so many of those consumers aren't quite ready to call you right away. In fact, only about 10% of the folks that visit your website are going to pick up the phone and call you right then and there, which means 9 out of 10 website visitors are just visiting your website and then not taking action. So what are we doing to make sure to give us a higher likelihood of those folks actually becoming customers. We have to try to remind them about our businesses. We have to give them that extra reminder that, hey, we are a top brand, we are a top provider, maybe you do want to work with us. Display ad retargeting can do that because when folks visit your website and then they see a familiar ad across the internet the next week, maybe it's two, three weeks later, that's what might convince them to click through and ultimately call you especially if they're doing research on what landscaper to hire, they're you know, getting hit over the head with referrals, recommendations, they're doing their own research, they're reading reviews, they might just want those extra reminders, yeah, this is the company that I want to work with. The good news about this service is that it can also target new audiences. So again, if you've ever done searches online um, and then seen an ad pop up related to those services, 
you can use that for your business. Now, yes, we get the question sometimes, well, isn't that uh, a little bit creepy? Like, should I be associated with that? And I always tell folks, well, wouldn't you rather a uh, potential customer see a brand or an ad for your business rather than your competitors? Because here's the thing, if a company like Amazon is doing this, they're having pretty good success with it. It's working pretty well for them, as I'm sure many folks have, on the call have seen from the last year or two. Um, so yes, the, the landscape businesses that use this are putting those extra reminders out there to folks that have visited their website, that have done these searches. Maybe somebody's trying to figure out how to make their lawn look greener. Maybe they're trying to figure out the cost of a landscaping job, a hardscaping job, a patio job, holiday lighting, snow removal, whatever. Um, but this can be a really effective strategy. Um, you know, I mentioned snow removal on the tail end of that. We hear about that. We get this question a lot when Matt and I are at Landscapes because Landscapes is always in October and we're always getting questions. What, what should I do to get more juice out of the winter season? Because normally, like, I cut my crews in half. We, you know, we know we're not going to be as busy and we really need to get whatever we can out of the winter time so that our employees are able to get paid and able to stay busy. Um, Maybe you're trying to do some of those wintertime off-season jobs, holiday lighting, snow removal, or just general hardscaping jobs in the winter if the ground's warm enough. Um, this can be a good way to get the word out about some of those services if people in your market are doing some of these online searches. So in terms of the actual ads and what they look like, we have a couple of examples here. You see your tall, skinny ones, your flat, horizontal ones. You see a square one. And you want to make sure these are universal specifications. So if you're going to run one of these campaigns on your own, which you can do on Google, you can do with a handful of providers that are out there, you want to make sure that you're staying within those specs, okay? It's kind of like, I don't know, different sizes of pieces of wood, right? There's going to be universal sizes for these ads, so you want to make sure um, that you are building the ads that fit appropriately. So in terms of the actual ads themselves, you want something that's going to remind people about your brand, about your business. Local lawn care you can count on. New York and Connecticut's tree care experts. Something that people might recognize from your website, from a TV or a radio ad that you did. Because all of a sudden, when we're trying to compete with those businesses that are popping up overnight, unlicensed contractors, when we've got a great website, we've got high rankings, we've got good reviews, we've got page one placement, and we've got ads that back everything up, all of a sudden we've got a five-step strategy that works really well together. So the best news about a program like this is that it only costs one cent every time these ads are seen. So here's what we did. We put together a small little case study here that helps shed a light on just how great this program can be. So one NA NALP member that we spoke to at Landscapes gave us the stats on his campaign. And he was basically spending $500 a month. With that $500, he was generating about 50,000 ad views. So impressions here in the middle column, those are gonna be ad views. So again, at one cent in ad, $500 budget will get you about 50,000 ad views and then 200 visits on average to his website per month on one of those cycles. What that works out to is folks visiting your website at a cost of $2.50 per click. So if I went to you and I said, hey, if I could get website visitors to go back to your website, if I could get people doing online searches to go to your website at a cost of $2.50 per click, I'd say it's a home run. When you compare that to traditional pay-per-click advertising that can have cost per clicks of $20, $30, $40, then we're talking about pretty good math here. Now, yes, some of those website visitors might already know you and may have planned to go back to your website anyway, but that's how all things are with marketing. It's never going to be a perfect concrete science, but this is definitely a strategy that we recommend. Now, here's my asterisk to that recommendation, which is that I would not suggest this be the foundation or focal point of your online marketing. It's not enough to just have a website and a display ad retargeting campaign. What makes this most successful is when you layer this on top of an SEO strategy or a traditional PPC strategy or direct mail, which we're still big believers in. Um, when you have a, a retargeting program that's running in tandem with a couple of those other marketing strategies, you can be 
more successful than if you were to only do one or two of those at a time because retargeting works best when you have a steady flow of traffic to your website and when you're getting your brand recognized right off the bat because that extra reminder will be that much more effective. And also, I'm going to jump in real quick because I, that is the number one question that I get the most is, okay, Matt, SEO is running well. What else should we be doing? And Alon just nailed it. You're spending money to try to get better placement on the web to get more traffic to hopefully get more phone calls. What better way, this is almost insurance at the end of the day on your SEO campaign because you're already trying to drive more traffic. Now, get these ads back in front of somebody who was already at your website or for somebody doing a search and they went to a competitor site, but because they did like-minded searches, you can now serve an ad to them. So the only exception um, is maybe you guys are just so busy, you don't want any more new work, you're, you're, you're good for a while, and you want these ads because of branding. But other than that, what Alon said, I had to jump in because I hear more than not that question, all right, SEO is doing well, what else should we be doing? And the answer is always display. Get that ad back in somebody. You're already working to get more traffic, so why not then have an ad go back to these people who visited your website? Nobody's going to your website simply to just look around. They're going there with an intent because they need one of your services. So getting that ad back in front of them for two weeks later when they got distracted because their kid ran into the room and all of a sudden they see your ad two weeks later and they say, oh, shoot, that's right. I did need these guys to come out. So absolutely fantastic. So I just wanted to jump in there, but hold on, let me get it back to you. Yeah, so one of the other items that I want to mention, and I'm glad Matt jumped in because unfortunately we don't have a slide on geofencing, but this is a really important strategy because this geofencing is very similar to display ad retargeting. So Matt, you're more familiar with it than I am. Maybe we can spend a couple minutes talking about that just to bring everybody up to speed. Of course, so with your traditional display ads, this is for some, when somebody visits your website and this is for the like-minded searches. What GeoFence is, and this is something pretty new and unique and really cool, um, unfortunately, that's the, a little bit of a nerd talk right there when I say cool, but you can get so targeted with the geofence, and there's a couple different ways you can do it. Let's say that you are in, so I'm going to use where we're located, for example. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, and over in Potomac, there are some pretty nice neighborhoods, some big homes where there's a lot of landscape design, maintenance that needs to be done. You can take that zip code, you can take that neighborhood, and you can draw a circle around it. And within that geo fence, you can serve your ad to those homeowners. So when those people, they don't hit your site, they don't do anything, they're just on the web, you can serve your ad to that audience because you just set up the campaign in a way that goes after that neighborhood, that zip code. So if there's a certain part of town that you want to get real specific in for whatever reason it is, maybe there's new construction. There are neighborhoods that are, that are being built. Do the geofence. People within that geofence, when they're on their phones, when they're on the web, will see your ad. Another thing, and this is where <laughs> it does get a little bit uh, of, of the um, real specific, but you can do a geofence surrounding a Home Depot or a Lowe's, and somebody within goes in there, you can serve your ad to them. And that's the cool part about it. So if you got somebody in there looking for fertilizer and then they walk out of the store and all of a sudden your ad pops up when they get into their car and look at your phone, you're targeting people within certain areas. You're basically drawing, and the term fence comes into play because you're initially drawing a fence around a certain area that you want to get very targeted with. We've had a lot of clients do this. And the thing is, they're targeting specific areas that they really want to try to get more exposure in. The same thing on commercial. A bunch of commercial clients are targeting certain parts of their service area where there's a lot of commercial properties where they want to try to get jobs in. So you can get real specific at the end of the day, which is pretty unique about geofencing when it boils down to it. Um, all right, so let's we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about this new feature from Google called local service ads. 
On the last presentation, we gave you a map A, B, C. At the beginning of this presentation, I'm going to chalk it up to Alon wanting to keep everybody on their toes, but he switched B and A. But let's remember, A is the paid search. B is your maps. C is your organic. It doesn't matter if B was paid search, A was maps. That, that, that means nothing. I'm just giving Alon a hard time. Um, a, B, and C. Now there's a new one. D. And this is called local service ads. This is a brand new feature that Google is vastly rolling out. They started testing it about three, four years ago, mainly West Coast, which they do everything, San Fran, Sacramento. I'm trying to get a feel for this. But basically, this is Google's new version, uh, new section, and it is pay per lead. So it is a pay per lead model, not pay per click. Not maps, not organic, but pay per lead. And we're going to talk about why this has been such a hit. Now, I know everybody's sitting there going, oh, pay per lead. You know, I may have tried that in the past, wasn't necessarily a fan of it. Did Home Advisor, did Angie's List. We're going to talk through it and how this is a little bit different than some of those. So as we dive in, you know, prepping for this new section, when you doing searches in certain areas, you may have already seen this. But I, my guess is most of you have not. If you were to do a search lawn care in Asheville, there is now a new section that pops up at the top. Or if you did air conditioning in San Francisco, that one always pops up. But you now can get here and you can see, mainly look at the one on the left. There's a green check mark that says Google Guaranteed. This is something different. And as a homeowner, if you see a green check mark that says Google guaranteed, wait, these guys are backed by Google? That's pretty cool. That's something new that I haven't seen before. It's catching on. Now, we're going to explain how to go through it. We're going to explain which areas it's in and how it all works. But this is new with Google. Like anything new with Google, there are definitely bugs that come with it. And so initially, it was the setup process because you have to go through a pretty long process in order to get the green check mark, which we'll talk through. But when this first rolled out, the paid search department at Google said, whoa, 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 you guys are coming into our territory and taking revenue out of our pocket. Well, yes, that is accurate. But Google, at the end of the day, I mean, they're taking revenue from both. So they're happy. But certain departments weren't necessarily thrilled with it. So that causes a little bit of internal friction and a little bit of a delay. But man, over the past couple of years, we have seen this thing really take off. And we're going to show an example of 2017 verse 18 in a second here. But once again, if you're wondering, well, where is it? What do I do? Do a search lawn care in Asheville. Do a search air conditioning Washington, D.C., air conditioning San Francisco. And you can see what we mean by Google Guaranteed. And I'm going to explain why the ones next to it don't have the Google Guaranteed. But real quick, 2017, what did this look like? We've got a map here, and you can see it was pretty much in all the major cities within the U.S. Down in Florida, Texas, California, Chicago, Seattle, and then you've got D.C., Boston, New York, but Miami, Dallas, uh, Phoenix, Denver, major, major cities. But look at 2018. I mean, whoa, this is really starting to catch on. Uh, do we get the next one? Ah, cool. All right. So now we can really see here that it is really growing. And that's why in the first year we thought, okay, let's see how long this lasts. I'm not exactly sure. Google tries new things all the time. Most recently, they tried Google+, Plus, which failed miserably. And Google's actually deleting all Google Plus pages over the next month. They tried to, tried to get in with Facebook and to do social media on their own. The guy quit who started Google Plus after the year. They brought somebody else on, and he was fired within six months. So Google's notorious for trying new things and not always working. We think this one might work uh, just because of the way that it is rapidly growing and adding into new areas. All right, so you've explained to me this. Now, really, what is it, and, and how do we go about it? Now, take a look at the different markets. 
So if you're in one of these markets, you may have already seen it, you may have already been approached, but more importantly, take a look at that cost per lead. That's pretty low. That's pretty low. And pay per click, we see the cost per lead anywhere 40 to $60. And here, I don't think I see any that are over 19. Now, will this change in six months? Yes. Absolutely. As more people get familiar with it, as more people sign up, we do think that this will change. But if you're in one of these markets on this call right now, we would encourage you to sign up. Try to get the green check mark. Try to go through this process of the Google Guaranteed. Because at the end of the day, it is free to go through this. And we want to make sure that we get you guys set up to take advantage of it. It is something new, and it does take a little bit of time, obviously, with the whole setup piece. Um, so let's go into that. So what do we uh, have to do in order to get this green check mark, this Google stamp of approval? So if it's in your area, then you can go on Google Local Service Ads, and it'll be a Google URL. You plug in your information. Now, you do, in order to get the green check mark, you do have to go through the process. Google wants to see proof of insurance, license information, and then they're going to do background checks. They're going to do background checks of the business owner, the company, and employees. That's usually the hurdle, and why it can take a little while is going through that is definitely takes time as far as that process goes, because they're going to make sure in order that for Google to have the guarantee and back you almost, they want to make sure that there's nothing fishy or funky going on within the company. So in order to set this up, you got to apply online. And on the slide, uh, a couple slides ago when we showed the example, notice how there were reviews. And earlier when we were talking about Google reviews and why you want to get those, this is being pulled from your Google My Business page. So now reviews are even more important because it's going to be looped in with the Google local service ads. The more you have, the better you're going to look. And most likely, Google might contact you if they're moving into your new area, if they like all of the reviews, because you guys have a lot of those. It's going to help you. So this is big. We encourage everybody to sign up and go through the process. It doesn't cost anything. And is that always going to be the case? Probably not. And you're not locked into anything. If you pass, you don't have to immediately start spending thousands of dollars. You can hold off on it, or you can set your budget and see what you want to spend on it. The cost per lead within the industry is pretty low right now. The number one thing that we always say, too, is you don't want to say, oh, I'll get to it down the road, wake up one morning, do a search, and your number one, two, and three competitors are the first three people within that area. So it's something new. It's something we've seen take off. And it is the pay-per-lead model. Now, if you worked with HomeAdvisor in the past and you're sitting there thinking, I don't really want to do the pay-per-lead, it is a little bit different. It's a one-to-one. -one. So, for example, when somebody clicks on your ad, Google isn't sending that to three or four contractors because typically in the past, the pay-per-lead was a little bit more for price shoppers and people just kind of seeing what is out there. Um, so this is a little bit different in that sense. Um, so I just rambled for a while, but talking a little bit more about this, I want to um, see if we do have Doug now. Um, turn it over to Doug, and if there's anything that uh, I missed in this last piece that I was talking about on local service ads, or if there's anything that you want to chime in on, uh, I know you have a ton of these conversations I'm just kind of walking through. So if there is anything that you want to chime in here, but I want to kind of kick it over to you uh, now here. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're, this is still very new in, in the industry, or your folks' industry. So um, what we've seen, and Matt probably talked a little bit about the background check process, some of that really depends on industry. So um, for example, Google initially rolled this out in the plumbing, HVAC, electrical, locksmith, and garage door industries. All industries where somebody has to go into your home to provide that actual service. They've rolled this out in other industries where uh, nobody needs to go into your home and the background check process was a lot lighter. Um, so 
I guess what we're trying to say is we aren't exactly sure how that's going to work for you. We, okay, our, our goal is to be as transparent as possible. Um, it may be that it's just the business owner and the business itself and less about any of your technicians who are going out to do a job. So um, they'll explain that process to you when you get signed up. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It still means you should try um, and see how it goes. But I think the main takeaway from this is this is the biggest shift in terms of how Google runs ads that's happened in the past 20 years since the advent of AdWords, which I think actually was 17 years ago. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. It's free to sign up now. That won't always be the case. The leads associated with this for folks or clients we have in other industries have been very cost effective. Um, and we feel like there's no it has all the upside in the world and, and very little downside. One of the other pieces that Matt probably mentioned is being one of the first to sign up has actually really led to a lot better visibility in the program. So as we saw from the previous slide, three ads in general will show up for any given search. But if you've got 30 um, Google guaranteed slash background check contractors in a market, only 10% are going to show at any given time. Yes, having more good reviews will help. Your response time to those requests will help. But um, we've seen the one thing Google doesn't say is if you're one of the first ones through the gates, we're more likely to give you a little bit more of the, the food that's on the table, the more of the opportunities that are out there. So that's one of the big reasons we recommend folks sign up, whether it's in your market yet or not. If it is, um, my guess is that probably fewer than three have already signed up. Again, that depends on where you are. Um, but it's absolutely something you should consider this year. All right, so one of the questions that we get a lot, and I've got some questions saved that uh, we'll address here before we wrap up, but one of the questions that we get a lot from folks is, how do I figure out whether this is something that I can do on my own versus needing to hire somebody else? Now, taking a step back for a second, we talked all about website design. We talked about SEO. A big portion of that was specifically talking about reviews. Then we talked about pay-per-click, and we talked about display ad retargeting. So those are our five main strategies for winning more business from the web in 2019. Now, all the folks on the line, you all know as well as I do, as well as we all do, that there's a ton of providers out there. And there are some really great ones. There's some not so great ones. So Doug, one of the questions that you get all the time, I mentioned the evaluations and the consultations that you do with folks, but a lot of times people call you and they ask, you know, what can I do on my own? I want to try to cut back on some costs. I want to try to do some of this stuff on my own versus, hey, I'm working with this company. How do I know that they're doing a good job? You know, they, of course, say I'm doing a pretty good job, but how do I really know? So what we did for NLP members was we put together this four-step guide to picking the right web marketing company. So Doug, pretend like I'm a contractor or I'm a landscape business owner. I gave you a call and I said, you know, here's what I'm doing. Here's what we think has, has been successful. Here's what we're not so sure about. How do you walk somebody through the process of figuring out whether they're working with the right web marketing company? Well, I think one of the biggest things it starts with is expectations. Um, Alon hears me talk about this a lot. Uh, while we are a web marketing firm, um, we'll be the first to tell you that online marketing is not all that different than probably the car mechanic industry. 80% um, of the providers out there are looking to take advantage of the lack of knowledge that business owners or operators like yourself probably have. Um, they promise this, they guarantee that. I think that anything that is, as it relates to promises and guarantees when it comes to the web is, is a big red flag. Frankly, I also think that cold calls are, are a kind of a red flag. I mean, you don't know much about that company. Um, it's really important you do research on who you work with, but expectations are critical um, because anybody who promises the moon um, that should that should raise a red flag for you. This stuff is complicated. If it were easy, everybody would do it. And that's a really important line. I mean, uh, it sounds so obvious, but there are folks who just say, yeah, we can take care of this. On the flip side of that, a lot of the conversations I have with NALP members are folks who are very um, suspicious of making a decision to work with anybody because they've been burned a number of times before. Um, we get that. Ultimately, as uncomfortable as it may make you, you're going to have to choose someone to trust. Um, perhaps that's somebody in-house. 
Maybe it's a friend, a family member, or a neighbor. I, I always recommend don't have any single points of failure. Um, so if you're relying on one person to do a lot of this stuff for you, as opposed to a, a company of some sort that can give you, um, it puts too much power in one place. But um, having industry knowledge is, is pretty important. And then having the expertise to implement the strategies that are going to work for your business is also important. Being able to report on the information that you're receiving is that third really important element. So um, being able to do the work, or excuse me, knowing what to do, doing it, and then actually reporting on it. And I think what I've heard is a lot of companies are good at one or two of those things. But when you work with somebody, you need to be able to have a relationship with them and understand why they're doing the things they're doing and what you should expect from that. A perfect example is something like Facebook. Okay, so um, if you're a landscape designer, for example, hardscape, patios, outdoor kitchens, what have you, um, I don't personally think, and this is my opinion, that doing ads on Facebook is the best way for you to target people. Um, and in lawn care, it may be a little different because that's seasonal, that's branding that you're really getting out there as quickly as you can. But um, hardscaping work, that's not where people go to make buying decisions. And a lot of times people have come to us and said, well, I spent all this money on Facebook and I didn't get anything out of it. Well, did, if somebody told you that you were going to get something out of it um, and you weren't able to track or measure those results, then, then that's a, a situation of poor expectation setting. So you have to figure out which of the strategies we've talked about today are the right fit for your business. Everybody needs to have a good website that meets Google and consumer expectations. That's the foundation of your online marketing presence, and there's nothing, there's no substitute for that. Um, now, when it comes to SEO, retargeting, paid search, the other things that we've talked about today, you have to figure out the right blend of that for your company. For some of you, it may be doing all of them. For others, it may be really focusing on one or two of those strategies based on how you acquire your clientele, knowing that in um, paid search, for example, some, some people tend to be price shoppers, whereas more people tend to make buying decisions in the organic results among savvier buyers. So um, that's a really critical piece. But understanding industry, um, not being committed for a specific amount of time, just because we're saying you, do, you shouldn't sign up with a contract doesn't mean this stuff um, is fast. It does take time to work. It's not a faucet. Again, you'll hear me say this many times. If it was easy, everyone would do it. But being tied into a contract takes away the incentive of the company providing the work to continue to deliver over the course of that contract. You're locked in no matter how well they do. Um, from our perspective, a smarter company would say, you should be willing to give this X number of months. And within that X number of months, here's what you should expect. Um, some programs can provide a more direct return on investment than others, but you always have to have goals and metrics by which you're defining success in what you're doing. Um, so that, that's a long answer to a, a very important but short question from Alon to say, you have to figure out what's right for your business. You have to decide who to trust. And I think that everybody should be doing their research um, when doing that. There are plenty of good local providers out there. One of the cons of that is sometimes local providers don't have industry expertise. Doing web marketing for restaurants and car dealerships and small um, retail shops isn't the same as doing it for companies like yourself. So you have to find the right blend and make sure that you are as bought in as they are. And holding the company you work with accountable is critical. Set goals. Make sure you're communicating with them. For the clients we work with, we always say the healthiest part of our relationship is back and forth communication. Um, but if we reach out to a client every month for six months and we don't hear back from them, um, it gives us concern because we're not touching base about what's working and what isn't. And uh, far more often than not, they'll circle back to us in month seven uh, and say, well, I heard you're not doing this or you're not doing that for me. And, and our response can only be, well, um, we need to have conversations about whether that makes sense for you. So uh, you need to take it upon yourself or your staff to make sure that you are consistently communicating with the folks that you're working with, because that's how you hold them accountable. Um, and they, in some ways, hold you accountable as well. This is your business. Every decision you make is driven by um, dollars and ethics and being smart about what you do. And um, 
for some of the folks we work with or I've spoken to over the years, members of NALP, um, another good example is people tend to continue to sign up for the phone books just out of fear of what will happen if they stop doing so, rather than assessing it based on whether they're actually getting a return on their investment from it. So um, be smart about your business just like you are in every other decision you make uh, every day. And we're here, whether we work with you on a consistent basis or not, as NALP's partner in a lot of this, our job is to help educate. So please feel free to take advantage of us as a resource, because if your provider is doing a great job, we will be the first to say, hey, these folks are actually doing a great job. I think you should stick with them. And they probably have some other great ideas that you can work with as well. So thank you, folks, for, for joining us here today. I know Alon's going to close it out. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that I want to address before uh giving everybody some uh, some takeaways, some uh, coupons, discounts, codes, next steps, all that stuff. So before we get to that, the questions and answers, we got one question, which was, how do I run display ads on my own? Um, you can set these up through Google. So basically, similar to how you might set up a paid ads, pay-per-click campaign, instead of using their search network, you would go in and do a display network campaign. Again, the things to keep in mind there are can you design the ads on your own? Can you optimize them? But definitely something that, that we suggest to folks, we recommend, give it a try on your own. If it doesn't work out, consider working with a provider. We can uh, work with NLP members. We've done it quite a bit uh, over the last two years on those campaigns, but um, definitely worth giving it a try on your own. So yes, you go into Google ads, ads.google.com, and then just set up a campaign through the display network. And then the second question, had to do with local service ads available in Canada. Um, Doug, maybe you want to answer that. This specific question had to do with Calgary. Um, so I don't know if we can do a quick search and see if uh, Lawn Care Calgary or HVAC Calgary has those ads starting to pop up. Um, but this is a question we get all the time. So it um, should be a pretty easy one for Doug to handle. So um, I know that local service ads so far are running in, bear with me folks, I'm pulling up a spreadsheet to help myself out here, um, running in Vancouver and Toronto, um, but nothing happening on the Calgary side yet. Um, I, I would expect that to happen down the road just based on how big Calgary is. Um, the only industries that this is running in for Toronto and Vancouver right now are HVAC, locksmith, and plumber. When Google goes to a new market, those tend to be the first three, maybe garage door, three or four industries that they test out. Um, so again, one of the things Matt may have mentioned before is just because local service ads are coming up in your market, it doesn't mean that they're running all the different types of industries that they can run. Um, if you know, we take a look at where these ads are running in the in the country today, um, some markets are running as many as uh, 20, 30 uh, of the the different types of local service ads. Some are just running one or two, um, but they really are starting to branch out. I think it's in over a hundred. Um, major markets now, and that's only going to increase over the coming weeks, and they will adjust it seasonally. So um, there will continue to be interest in pushing this out for more, um, we expect, lawn, lawn companies and cities where this these services are being provided over the next year or so. I think it's just important, like we talked about, to make sure that you submit your information uh, and make sure that you're coming up in front of as many as possible. But when we look at um, did we uh, did we list off the cities along where it's running right now in, in lawn care? So we just showed the map. Right now, if you're in Atlanta, interesting, Chattanooga, Dallas, Fort Myers, Naples, Jacksonville, Kansas City, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Nashville, Norfolk, uh, Orlando, Philadelphia, Raleigh, Durham, and Tampa. Those are the active markets in the country where lawn care ads are running for local services. But they're running in, that's uh, essentially 15 markets, but they're running local service ads in 85 other markets, and they probably will start to implement more lawn care programs going forward. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and we, I think, covered all the questions, but if anybody has any leftover questions, be sure to chat those through. I'm going to go through some giveaways for attendees, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Lisa Wood for some final remarks on NLP side. So. Um, 
For folks that want to take advantage of a website SEO evaluation or just a general web marketing evaluation consultation, um, I highly recommend that. I've mentioned it a couple times just because I sit across from Doug and I hear him do these um, throughout the day and there's so much value packed in. Look, we can uh, sit up here and talk about web marketing and answer questions, but nothing compares to a one-on-one -on -one consultation to talk about what you're doing, what you think is working, and us to say what we think you could change about it. Um, it's very rare that you have a resource available to you that can be non-biased. Uh, but because of our relationship with NALP, that's our job. We have to be unbiased in having those conversations with you. So I highly recommend that because you'll get Doug as a resource, taking a look at your website, your pay-per-click ad spend, your rankings. He'll even look and see what some of your competitors might be doing. And there's a ton of value to be had there. Because in order to make improvements, we talked about this with the, the Google Analytics and some of the call tracking in order to really be able to measure your success and have goals for the year, you have to know where you stand right now. Unless you can confidently answer exactly how well you feel about your website and web marketing, then you might want to hop on one of these calls and talk to Doug and get a sense of, okay, this is what we're doing pretty well, but you know our SEO strategy might need a little bit of work. Maybe we dial it back on social media and spend a little more time on email newsletters. There's a lot that goes into it. It's like a, a wide-scale landscaping job. You know, maybe you can say, or maybe I can say as a consumer, well, I think my yard or patio looks pretty good, and this is me fantasizing because I live in an apartment in a big city and I don't have a yard, but I'd like to be able to say I have a yard and a patio that looks pretty good. But when you get down in the details and you start to evaluate the hedges and the bushes and how healthy is the grass and how does the the stones and the hardscape patio look. There's a lot that goes into it, and web marketing is pretty similar. Now, if you want to work with Market Hardware on some of the strategies or programs that we talked about today, yes, we are a web marketing company, and we do offer websites. We offer SEO, display ad retargeting, paid search campaigns. We can help you get set up on local service ads if we're working with you on one of those other programs. So if you want to take advantage of one of those programs, we'll offer you a credit for one month's management on any of those. So be sure to mention this webinar if you end up talking to Doug and you want to discuss our pricing, our packages. We know every landscape business is different. We don't want to have a one-size-fits-all approach. That's where a lot of web marketing companies go wrong, like Doug said. We want to make sure that we're fitting you into a package that works specifically for you. But again, that is not why we're here. We're here to educate, and hopefully we did a good job um, I think it's amazing. You know, Doug, we had most of these folks stick around for the entirety of the three-hour program today. We only had a couple folks drop off. Um, so I want to send a sincere thank you to everybody for sticking around with us. You guys asked a lot of awesome questions. Um, you guys were so wonderful as an audience today, which is why we love doing these webinars. We love going to landscapes each year. Um, hopefully we're able to continue to do all of those things because it's it really is. It's it's a pleasure for us to be able to do them. Um, so with that said, it doesn't look like we've gotten any other questions. So before I turn it back over to Lisa, I want to, of course, thank NALP for doing such a great job in everything that they do, but also for helping make the arrangements for us to be on the call. Um, Joe and Dynascape, of course, have to thank you guys one last time. If you haven't talked to the Dynas Dynascape guys, I can't recommend it enough. They've got an awesome product. Um, we talked to a few of their customers that are thrilled with them. So I'm a big fan of theirs. I know that their customers are a big fan of theirs. I would highly recommend you checking them out. Um, if you have more questions about them and you want to just talk to us, then I'm happy to give you my two cents. Um, but definitely, definitely want to uh, mention those folks because they're a big uh, party player in the industry. And we love folks that specialize in landscaping. We specialize in landscaping. Obviously, uh, NLP does. That goes without, without saying. Um, but sponsors like Dynascape help keep the industry moving along and help keep the industry healthy and successful. Um, so thank you to them for sponsoring the event today. Um, Lisa, I, I'm not sure if you're still there, but uh, did you have some last words that you wanted to mention? 
Yeah, thank you, Alon, and all of the staff at Market Hardware for this great webinar, and of course to Dynascape for sponsoring it. And we just wanted to let you know, in order to improve these webinars, we want we would love for you to take a few minutes to fill out our survey, which was sent to your email just a few minutes ago. We really appreciate your feedback, and we'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend. Thanks again, everybody, for participating. Have a great day.